My name is Will Dixon here. I'm director here at FedTech, leading our accelerators portfolio. I'm really excited to bring to you here the third of our uh, Army Cyber Innovation Summits here that we've been launching here for the past kind of few months. Um, really exciting stuff planned. If we want to go to the agenda slide, we'll kind of uh, just give everyone kind of teaser before we hand it over to the, um, you know, the, the program director here. So um, high level agenda and, and kind of the goals of what we're talking about today. So um, and the, these Army Innovation Summits really, again, aimed at kind of uh, telling the story of this new U.S. Army Applied Cyber Program, where we're about to hear from Dr. Matt Willis, the program executive within the, uh, the Office for the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition Logistics Technology. Um, so he's going to, you know, re-educate us and share kind of the motive for how it came to be, you know, the, the nuances of how it was developed and how it's currently still being launched. And i um, really excited. And the, the focus and why we call this one about tech transition is because really the focus and the secret sauce of the program and how the Army's kind of, you know, turning over its acquisition priorities and how it does business with non-traditional partners here. Um, we're going to dive deep into this kind of tech transition ecosystem. So I'll kind of give us a short talk outlining what that looks like. And then, uh, you know, so we can teach and, and show, but we really want to show. And so we're going to highlight, some, you know, a case study here of what has been a really successful integration um, with actually a company that was in the X-Tech Search 5 uh, prize competition as a finalist in BAE Systems. Uh, we'll do a quick panel, I'll moderate, asking kind of some questions uh, about, you know, hey, what's it like to partner with the Primes? Um, and again, we'll get deeper in here on why exactly it is so important to include larger technology integrators in this kind of early stage applied cyber work. And, and Dr. Willis will share more on that as well. And then we'll kind of move into the meat of highlighting this, uh, you know, cohort one, which is a pilot cohort we've been running here uh, for the applied cyber program, it, an actual startup accelerator for uh, seven companies within that have recently won applied cyber awards. So, um, and again, it was some distinct ways to engage. I encourage everyone to use the chat here. We'll be paying attention to it, especially as we get into the case study and panels. You know, those will be very interactive. Um, and really excited to have everyone here. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Matt Willis. Um, he's going to kind of give a quick overview of the U.S. Army's Applied Cyber Program. And, and, um, and, and again, he's the director of the Applied Cyber Program and Army Prize Competitions within uh, the ASAL office. So, Matt, um, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Will. And um, thank you for, for everyone for participating and tuning in this, this afternoon. So again, um, what Will said is briefly this morning, sorry, it's already the afternoon. <laughs> it's been one of those days. And so <laughs> briefly this afternoon, I'm just gonna go through some of the, the inspiration behind the changes uh, that we've been implementing over the last several months in the, the Army's SBIR program. Again, really focusing on how we can uh, bring customers in up front to ensure that you know we are treating the SBIR program really as it's intended, right? As as America's seed fund um, sponsored by the government to uh, develop, deliver, and transition uh, technologies um, to the to the warfighter uh, for for Army needs. So uh, next slide, please. I don't like looking at myself. Um, so just, just a, a little bit of context here, right? So many of these changes have been ongoing for, I said a few months, it's actually been uh, about 18 months. Uh, so almost two years now where the army took a, a deliberate, um, pause in terms of how the SBI, our program was, was operating and, uh, restructured in a way that had, uh, two portfolios with um, deliberate uh, fo focuses. So, so one portion of the portfolio specifically focuses on uh, the science and technology uh, base uh, executed through the labs. And the other portion of the program, which is uh, the portion we'll be speaking about today, specifically focuses on customers in our program executive offices and PMs. So that's looking more at end items and how we can uh, transition SBIR technologies um, into programs of record. And that's why it's also critical today as part of this to, um, to bring in our, uh, our prime partners, our partners within the defense industrial base, because in many ways, uh, they are the organizations that will be facilitating, uh, you know, scaling up, and um, integrating these technologies into future army systems. So again, uh, next slide, please. 
So I'm sure all of you or many of you are obviously familiar with the SBI or program if you are um, participating in this event today. Um, but you know, really what we're trying to do is uh, deliver innovation through collaboration. So what does that mean? That means collaborating, of course, across Army stakeholders, uh, but also collaborating with uh, small businesses that are executing the work. And then, of course, our defense uh, industrial base partners. So how can we break down barriers working with the Army? How can we make it easier for um, organizations to participate in the program? And how can they, uh, you know, the, the innovation community see the SBIR program as, you know, a, a viable partner and not just a funding mechanism, right? So we certainly want to um, see companies and firms that participate in the SBIR program to be successful in as many ways as possible uh, so that they can uh, continue to develop technologies that will transition to uh, the Army so we can empower our soldiers um, with the best technologies that are out there and, and available. So again, it's really all about building up this collaborative ecosystem, both within the Army, but also external to the Army across uh, small business ecosystems and then the broader defense industrial base. Next slide. So what makes us different? Um, so, you know, I, I've highlighted a few things on here. And so really what we're trying to do is, is take a, a, you know, a fundamental look at what are the best acquisition mechanisms available uh, that we can deploy within the program to uh, reduce proposal requirements, streamline awards, reduce time to capital, you know, maximizing initial cash flow. We recognize that um, oftentimes the, the speed of government contracting is, is, uh, well, it's not, not very speedy, right? So, um, I've, you know, directed my team to really question everything in terms of how the program has historically been run and figure out how we can, um, you know, expedite the processes for not only engaging with the program, but once a, once a firm is selected, getting you on contract and executing the work, because you know we recognize for for you, uh, you being the the small business community, but even the, the the defense industrial base as well. You know, time is money, and you know if we are uh, perpetuating or delaying the start of uh, research related to a critical technology, uh, that's just um, delaying our ability to mature that technology and get it in the field. So. Uh, so we are, you know, taking a strong look at how we can expedite all of these these different activities. In addition, we're in, we're um, taking a strategic look at the areas that we are focusing the SBIR program, specifically to identify those domains that, of course, have Army needs, but also have unrivaled uh, private sector expertise. So where can the Army essentially gain synergy by investing in certain uh, technology sectors that already have a confluence of, of expertise within the private sector. And um, the, the management of these different technology areas is uh, being done under this construct that we've termed the transition broker team. But essentially, what does that mean? That means that we're bringing in our users, so our program executive offices, our PMs, uh, we're bringing in soldiers, um, technologists, uh, and acquisition officers to really try to develop upfront a cohesive program plan uh, that has a user in mind. So not only are we developing technologies under the auspices of the SBIR program, but we are planning for transition upfront. So we're looking at what is the, the that back end look like. So um, if the research is successful, there are opportunities, transition opportunities, phase three opportunities um, for uh, for the efforts that, that uh, ro roll out of the SBIR program. Um, and I know I've, I've quoted, uh, I've used this quote a lot, but you know, I found that it's good to, to quote your boss, right? So, uh, you know, Honorable uh, Warmoth said this in her confirmation hearing that, um, and I think this, this demonstrates how important small businesses are to Army innovation. And she specifically called out that we needed to not only develop, but implement a more business-friendly SBIR approach that does all of these things that I just spoke to. Uh, next slide. 
So in terms of the, the approach, right, I think this, is, this also speaks to, to, to what I, I was just talking about. And it's that there is no standard SBIR award. This is no longer a cookie cutter program where, you know, phase one is X and a phase two is Y and then a second phase two is, is Z, right? I mean, we're really uh, trying to understand what the acquisition profile should look like and then use that to define what the SBIR uh, project profiles it should look like. So uh, what the phase one award amount should be and what the timeline should be. You know, phase two, should there be a sequential phase two? Can you have a direct to phase two? What's the resourcing amount? So um, again, I, I think that this just speaks to, again, a sort of a fundamental relook at the SBIR program. Uh, there are certain limitations, but um, we, we can get exceptions as well. So I think that, that the point of this is that um, we are trying to be deliberate about understanding from the Army side what our needs are and from the business uh, community side, uh, how can we deliver that within a certain amount of time and then leverage the flexibilities in the SBI or program to deliver and transition to technologies. Next slide. So I already spoke, spoke to, to, to this a few moments ago, but I think it's an important point, right? And that um, we're developing this new construct under the auspices of this transition broker team concept, which balances the scope of acquisition authority, uh, requirements among stakeholders, uh, and acquisition strategy to, to deliver both near, mid, and far-term uh, capabilities. And I think that this, uh, this fundamental shift in terms of how the portfolio is organized and executed um, will certainly deliver results, focus on transition. And I hope that it will also benefit uh, you know, the, the small business and defense industrial based ecosystem as well, because there should be or there will be much more transparency regarding uh, what our priorities are um, and where, where the portfolio is, is moving. Uh, next slide. So finally, uh, that, that was like a, a 50,000 foot quick overview of uh, some of the changes we've been making to date. So why are we here today at, at this, uh, this third innovation summit. So, so just for context, for the, the first innovation summit, which was a couple months ago, um, we really uh, laid out many of the changes that I just went through briefly. Um, the second summit was uh, specifically focused on internal army uh, customers trying to get uh, our stakeholders more aligned with uh, re really galvanizing the technology transition pipeline from uh, laboratories uh, to uh, program executive offices to our, our user communities out, out in the field. So today in the, the third summit, we're focusing more explicitly on how uh, external partners can support this technology transition pipeline across the Army. So, um, you know, we're really trying to focus more explicitly on speed, efficiency, and trying to understand upfront what our requirements are so we can develop a cohesive, a cohesive and coherent SBIR strategy that focuses on transition. Um, so, you know, a lot of this, of course, depends on partnership both within the Army, but it also includes partnership within the defense industrial base. So again, I'm looking forward to um, some of the panel discussions coming up uh, with some of our prime partners uh, to get their perspective on uh, what value they see in partnering with uh, small businesses, startups, innovation community, and how we can best leverage uh, the SBIR program to, to do that. Um, we're also going to be hearing uh, this afternoon from the, the first cohort of participants in our Applied Cyber Accelerator. So we've established this accelerator under the auspices of the Applied Cyber Program, which is specifically focusing on, again, how we can um, educate and facilitate uh, small businesses that are participating in the SBIR program to, to navigate the Army ecosystem, anything from um, how we can uh, posture them to be successful for uh, future SBIR uh, 
you know, proposals, how they can best understand what Army needs are, how they can navigate the complex Army ecosystem, how they can engage with uh, other customers external to the Army, external to the DOD, or even external to the government. So again, this is this uh, overarching uh, methodology that we're trying to set in place for um, for the SBI, our program, again, to, to posture small businesses for continued and future success. So, so this afternoon, we're going to be hearing from, again, the, the first, I think, seven companies that participated in, in this, this cohort. Again, so this is focused on how we can deliberately set up a next generation technology transition pipeline uh, under the auspices of, of the SBI, our program. So again, um, I think we have a lot of great, great things on on tap for this afternoon, um, and I encourage you, as as Will did, to um, to enter questions or comments into the chat uh, window, um, and also certainly you can follow up with with uh, emails or. Uh, phone calls, carrier pigeons, uh, you know, whatever, uh, you know, what we're constantly looking for your feedback. We want to improve the program. Again, we're trying to set this up for the benefit, of course, of, of our, our ultimate customer, the soldier, but it's really facilitated by the innovation community that's participating here today. So um, I'll pass it back to Will and uh, again, uh, looking forward to the, uh, the summit this afternoon. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. And well said. We do have one quick question in the chat, actually. To um, yeah, I can I can paraphrase it for you. But essentially, um, you know, someone wondering, hey, you know, what other uh, you know, they they called out X Tech specifically applied cyber. Just wondering, are there any other alternate funding paths and programs? And then um, a question about who exactly the reviewers are, you know, for the application. Well, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of funding opportunities, you know, with, within the army for small business, large business, academia, et cetera. And um, certainly I would say that there is no one, one source uh, for where all of these different opportunities are. So uh, we're working on that in concert with army futures command, uh, you know, who has oversight for all of the science and technology labs and army applications labs. So, um, what I will, will say is, uh, you know, so we have social media, uh, presences across the Cyber, Sitter, x -Tech program. Um, we're constantly, um, linking to other army opportunities. Of course, you can go to, uh, beta.sam.gov, but that's, uh, a somewhat archaic system that's challenging to navigate, but, uh, uh, I would say stay tuned. Uh, we, we recognize that this is a, a challenge regarding the many diverse opportunities that are out there. Um, so I guess the other quick question about the reviewers. So in terms of the reviewers, all of the reviewers for, for SBIR um, proposals are uh, their government employees. And we honestly take pride in the fact that we are getting a relatively diverse perspective on every single proposal to include uh, users. So we have uh, actual field units with technical backgrounds that are reviewing proposals. Uh, we also have reviewers from the acquisition community. So from across our program executive offices, uh, program managers. Um, so the actual customers of these technologies, if they are successful. And also we have reviewers from the, the science and technology base. So scientists, engineers across Army Futures Command, across the laboratories that can provide that sort of deep technical review of the technology. So um, we, we pride ourselves again, like I said, on having this diverse perspective on, on every single proposal. Awesome. Over. Thanks for answering that, Matt. And, and definitely, we'll reiterate it again. We, we've been working with with Dr. Willis and some of the, the Army's kind of next gen tech priorities, and that is definitely one of the secret sauces. And you, someone mentioned that they got good feedback. Um, encourage everyone to apply. I know that's one of the you know alternative things that the team is focused on. That every company that engages the Army, right, even if your initial contract application is not successful, uh, you know the the Army and you know Matt Matt referenced doing some really good work to bring together diverse perspectives to give that feedback regardless. So you walk away with a little bit of you know kind of information related to customer discovery, right, in the terms of business. So 
Um, great question there, Bill. And you know, again, encourage everyone to con continue, um, you know, putting stuff in the chat here and we'll address it periodically. So um, we'll, we'll move forward here and I'll highlight um, just to, again, a quick intro for myself. So I, I lead our kind of startup accelerators here at FedTech and, you know, we, we focus explicitly on kind of the deep tech ventures of which the military and the DOD, the Army is very interested in. Um, in my background myself, you know, technical background, um, done some product development. Um, works a large company, but we're all to say we're, we're laser focused on solving this problem. Um, and it starts with me here. So to, to keep moving on here, well, I want to talk a little bit again, just reframe here. So traditional small business mechanisms, right? Um, rehashing some of the importance of what Matt was, was saying there. But again, you know, the, the themes, you know, why just the impetus to rephrase what, what he said from a different perspective here, right? For, for businesses, it was difficult to understand. It was, you know, hard to penetrate. You know, there's a reason enormous, you know, government contractors have lots of full time business development staff, right? For a non-traditional, really innovative small business, very difficult to get there, right? And somewhat siloed. So um, if you move forward and kind of, you know, looking at um, kind of what's coming next, uh, if you get the next slide, the, you know, the transition, pro the, the acquisition priorities that Matt referenced, again, three big buckets of speed, ease of access for companies, and then transparency. Um, and to get to kind of the point of what I'm trying to, to share with everyone today, really talk transparently about what does this technology transition ecosystem look like? Who plays a role where, right? And let's, you know, let, let, let's throw out a hypothesis, go back and forth. Um, a big thanks. I know a lot of you guys in the room have talked with us before, you know, over the past six months, we've been doing our own kind of user discovery to help us understand your needs. And we can really craft a, a landscape that works for everybody. So um, if you have the next slide there, Brian, the, the last thing I'll highlight before going in again, highlighting kind of the way things used to transition again is, a lot of DOD programs focusing on solving similar problems here, right? And, um, you know, the, the Army's applied cyber program, I think, again, objectively, is one of the ones most laser focused on tech transition. Um, you know, other ones in the past have focused, hey, let's get the non traditional folks, hey, let's teach people what it's like to work with the government. Um, you know, the applied cyber program within all that has been paying attention, you know, as Matt alluded, right, the X tech program specifically has been around since 2018. It was his leadership that it was kind of started up and, you know, starting to gather the data points in all of that data of operating for the past few years has informed what the applied cyber program is looking for. So just some additional background there saying, hey, you know, this hypothesis that we're throwing out should be pretty accurate based on kind of the homework and, and um, elbow grease that's been put into it by Matt and his team. So let's get to the meat of it, the tech transition pipeline, what it looks like. So um, again, it involves large companies. And so perspective of a small business here, this is kind of the way that, you know, things are done today, right? There's large businesses that have needs, smaller businesses that have kind of validated novel technologies. There's kind of iterative process of, hey, you know, does it fit from a business perspective? You know, is it going to make sense as an industry, right? Um, you know, if you guys notice a lot of the, you know, really large defense industrial base are you know publicly traded right that you know they, they are businesses designed to kind of make money and profit and be sustainable for many many years and so you know is the business case there hey is the technology legitimate here um a lot of the forms that typically get used is this kind of r d contract it's like hey you know you have that really great material you know could you actually build a gas tank with that material for us and let you know, let us test it let us see what's operating we you know as we as a prime contractor we can fund something you know a piece of that right um, and that's kind of what it takes to kind of get in the door and figure out if it's worth sustaining, right? And that, you know, again, that becomes a, a business decision based on the army or the military as a customer with continued subcontracting. And even, at, you know, there, there are cases of equity investment acquisitions by larger defense industrial based firms and startups. But all that to say there, I think that the thing to focus on is that I don't see the army anywhere in here, right? You know, that, that's, that's the one thing throughout this whole process, every player is trying to interpret what are the demand signals of the U.S. Army? Which customers are out there? Hey, I have a material science thing. You know, does it go on a vehicle, on a plane, on a you know, et cetera, et cetera? Um, you know, the Army is not really a part of this process, right? And there's there's many reasons we could get deep into for, for why that is. Um, but I think one of the things to remember in this kind of future hypothesis we're going to we're going to throw out here is that you know that we we want the demand signals of the Army as a customer to be a big piece of this process. Um, and so if you go to the next slide here, we'll, we'll again, a little complicated, we won't spend too much time on it, but, um, you know, what, what's kind of the, the, the interaction between these players, right? And again, you know, prime contractors represent the large defense industrial base to have the capability to deliver capabilities at scale. Um, we've heard customers say, hey, you know, when we, when we write a contract for something, we needed 100 versions of it yesterday, right? You know, a startup fundamentally cannot do that, cannot deliver at scale that quickly, right? So, Prime contractors have a you know a really important part, a really important role in how the national security base functions. Um, 
small businesses here, again, there are some, you know, government programs like XSEC Applied Cyber, right? And the idea is that through this new Applied Cyber program, we tie a lot of this more together, again, in a transparent kind of open, you know, straightforward uh, serial way here. Um, and the last thing I want to highlight again is, is just the nuance of why the small business community will always be able to kind of innovate more quickly, try new things. Um, it, it's really to us kind of a fundamental physics of organizational science, you know, like a smaller group of people can, you know, have a new idea, throw it out there, test it, validate assumptions, get some feedback, pivot around that idea much more quickly than a normal organization, right? And there are pros and cons to that, right? That first idea may not be enormously impactful, um, but there's just a fundamental difference of physics of how organizations work, why small businesses and startups will always have to be a necessary piece of this kind of triangular ecosystem here. So let's move forward. Now, I want to highlight, um, want to highlight here and you know, just kind of laying out some assumptions for as we build this landscape here. So um, we're, we're assuming, right, that, you know, that let's assume people are not experts in doing business with the government, right? Let, you know, as we build it, let's just assume people are not great at that, right? Um, you know, so how do we make it transparent and easy to access? Um, again, the Army's role is to be demand signals. You know, you know, Dr. Willis has referenced a few times just to, to put stuff at one point, right? Involving large-scale customers in the topic generation, the judging, the, you know, the transition broker teams for the Applied Cyber Program is critical to ensuring their demand signals for what's being developed and invested R&D in. Um, the next one, again, transparent, simple. We, we talked a little bit about that. And then again, by nature, it, it must include not just internal partners with the Army. We actually had you know, a second summit that was actually closed to the public, focused just the Army stakeholders. Huge organization, right? There's requirements generation, there's you know, science technology directors, there are large customers, there, there's lots of other folks within the Army, the user community, um, even just internal champions administrators. Um, all those people are important to bring together in the internal side, and then the external must be included as well in kind of the defense crimes and stuff we talked about. So, Real high level because the next slide is going to be a little uh, a little gritty there, a lot of stuff on the slide, but let's talk about the, the high level hypothesis we're building. There's four major steps in terms of how, you know, a small business or some innovative organization can get that technology all the way to the warfighter. Number one, is the Army a customer? You know, again, there, there's most of the businesses we work at FedTech and you know, I'm sure a lot of you have seen, you know, we have, you know, seven, seven awesome small business startups in the room here. Right, you got to do some research. Is the army even my customer? You know, unless you are in the DC area, have someone in the military in your family, or you know, you have a you hired a veteran, it's not it's not always intuitive or obvious whether or not the army is even a customer for what you're developing. Um, number two, okay, answer is yes, I think so. Okay, first contract, right? You see, first contact, first contract there, um, and that's really the second biggest step there because a contract represents a legal obligation, a commitment. Hey, that is interesting to me, and more than interesting, you know. Um, we all like people to tell us our, our baby is not ugly, um, but our baby is ugly unless, you know, someone's paying for it from a business perspective, right? So that's the, that's the signal of the first contract is really showing a, a legitimate demand signal for that technology. The next step, which is kind of the, the complicated part we'll highlight in the next one, is the transition activities, right? And that's what we want to try to throw out some hypotheses of how that works and how people in, in this room can play, play a role here. But again, taking the tangible steps to sell a fully functional product to the Army, right? And this has been, I think, one of the, the great, you know, uh, learnings of most folks who have been winning SBIR awards for the past few decades. And then, you know, now in, in the, the nuance one, right, it's, it's very different to say, oh, I can have a whole business model just doing lots and lots of R&D contracts, right? We're trying to change that to say, hey, you can have a great business model by using that R&D contract to develop a product that you then sell at scale, you know, in partnership or not with the military here. And focus, again, on that, that the success here is, the Army purchasing my product, fielding it to operators more broadly. So um, we'll go to the next slide here and get a little bit deeper here because I want to get to, you know, I want to get to more of the specifics for how everyone here can play a role and get engaged. So again, um, th this is kind of hypothesis. I'll walk through one by one. Um, encourage everyone not to try to, to read or, or uh, I'll go left to right here. But again, it all smarts, starts with a small business, you know, dual use product for the most part, right? Some innovative technology being developed with some commercial interest. Hey, you know, the military could, could be interesting here. Winning that our applied super program, right? And the fundamental that the shift in the applied super program, as Matt said, again, is it, it it's going to include some demand signals from large scale customers, which ideally, you know, gets people on board much earlier in the process to get them championing that technical innovation to make it all the way to a large scale product. Um, our role, and this is the first opportunity for anyone in this room to get involved, is as mentor is showing up to exposure days as part of our the Army transition cohorts, the applied super accelerators we were mentioned. Um, and again, we, you know, a perfect example of that is second half of today will be pitches from the seven companies, 
Um, so that's one way to get involved up front just to learn, understand the mentorship. Um, another area just kind of to touch and understand and get involved with some of these businesses early on in an unstructured fashion. Um, and again, eventually these companies are going to emerge with a very strong case for an army transition pathway, right? Which includes a few big things right there. There are internal army transition activities, right? Doing demonstrations on bases, generating signals, customer discovery, um, you know, some research, right? There's a lot of activities that, you know, any company has to do in order to do business with the military, regardless of who they partner with or actually pursuing the acquisition strategy. It takes time, effort, money, et cetera. And then there's kind of two options to actually transition, right? Some, some small businesses possess a capability based on the size or niche of the need and the demand signal to pursue full acquisition on their own. And that's perfectly fine. But for some of the larger, more complicated programs, again, that require a very high degree of product development excellence, right, is, is one way to put the kind of operational needs. And, um, you know, one another example we found with working with some companies is when you get to the point of selling to the military and they're like, hey, OK, give me, you know, give me a proposal for how you're going to conduct operation and maintenance for the next 10 years. Right. That is very foreign to any early stage startup and small business. Right. The infrastructure required to report uh, to support that very different from the infrastructure required to get a small business or startup to actually talking about the technology and that technology to, to kind of prototype. And that's and that's where the, the, the large the large primes come in. Um, and again, so, you know, we would listen just, you know, this is not any you know, formal selection, just a, a highlight for who those large defense primes are just to educate people here. They are the large, you know, people with existing programs of records in the, you know, millions, billions of dollars, right? You know, huge scale acquisition and it's a cornerstone of the kind of national security delivery base for technology. So um, that, that's kind of the way, you know, the, the encouraging, you know, we'll look at the chat here at the end and see if there's any relevant questions, but Again, this is the blue but the blue things here. If you go to the next one, we'll kind of get quickly just to the takeaways and finish up the section here. Um, a, a small, again, we'll, we'll we'll share this after, but just you know, th this is kind of a journey map of what it might look like for one of those applied cyber awardees to go through this path to partnering with the prime, right? You know, getting connected, participating in the accelerator programming, um, you know, going through the continuing interaction, the legal ease, the technical, et cetera, et cetera. And again, we we want to make sure we're playing the, the role of kind of trusted validator here at FedTech and with the you know Army Applied Server Program to make sure that you know that the demand signal is signaled up front and it you know helps justify and say, hey, you know, for a prime, I think the big takeaway for a lot, a lot of the large defense uh, companies in the room here is you know, look at the Army Applied Cyber Program as being, one, a validator that the Army does want this technology in a large system one day. It could be a competitive differentiator for a much bigger contract. And two, the technical validation, right? You know, I know there's great partnerships with the S&T community in the Army to make sure that the technology being developed within the Applied Cyber Program is legit, meaningful, differentiated across the market, right? That That's one of the secret sauces of the, the DOD in general, a lot of amazing technical staff. And I know for a fact, a lot of those people participate in the judging process. So if you go to the next slide here, we'll get to get to the takeaways and, and we'll end it here. Um, I'll look through the chat in a minute here, but the, uh, again, opportunities for external partners here to kind of join this tech transition ecosystem. So again, mentorship, you know, reach out to us, you know, you got, uh, if you're, if you're unsure what it's like to get involved want to learn more, mentorship's a great opportunity to do that. Um, showing up to pitch days, you know, as Dr. Willis mentioned, the, you know, the applied cyber accelerators are kind of the concrete, um, you know, mechanic to take an early, you know, taking a winner and moving into more and more, a more mature, ready to sell and understand what partnering means for the government. So show up to those pitch days. It's our, our goal here to make those companies really legitimately prepared for those pitch days, right? Um, and again, direct engagement to kind of this prime integrators network. And that's something we're still kind of fleshing out the nuts and bolts of, but um, again, the huge thanks to people who, um, you know, who have been, who have been, you know, talking to us over the past six months. We'd love to have more conversations with you. Want to understand your needs as we launch this to make sure we can bring, you know, large integrators in in a consistent, transparent fashion. So, um, with that, uh, I'll, I'll pause here and um, let, let's, I'll, I'll take a quick look through the chat to see if there's any questions worth worth answering real quick. Oh, wow, the, the chat was pretty active here. Um, Anyone on anyone on my team want uh, any interesting questions we should address right now before moving on? Yeah, so, so a question kind of on some mission timelines, right? So I think that's that's something that's still being fleshed out. But um, from, from the applied cyber program, the goal is to if you you know submit an application, you know again the goal is you receive feedback, positive or negative, very rapidly, ideally. 30 to 60 days. Um, and again, they're, they'll be released, uh, you know, on that applied cyber website. So um, another question here. So, you know, the cyber's from the army. Why isn't the army a customer? 
Um, very interesting uh, nuance, uh, you know, helpful to understand the history of the uh, SBIR program that it, it was initially stood up as to have the any organization within the federal government that receives over $100 million in technical R&D flavored funds. Um, those organizations, you know, were required to spend 3% of those on, uh, you know, external R&D partners, right? So small businesses through the SBIR, right? When you think about that, what does that mean when the topics are generated? Is that means the topics are meant to be extensions of R&D, meaning there's lots of opportunities for businesses to win contracts around R&D contracts, but not necessarily tying those explicitly to large scale needs with the warfighter, right? You know, the, the, the function of R&D within the military is to prove the art of the possible, you know, you know, push the boundaries, right? Not necessarily field those technologies all the way. So um, hopefully that, that answers your question, Charles, a little bit, you know, the, the, the goal here with the newer one is to involve those downstream large scale customers and users up front, um, you know, so, so that they, you know, so that the topics represent a larger customer need, you know, the, the same way if you're out in the commercial space, you know, right, having, having some early stage customers, a large corporation could eventually be huge sales to a large corporation. All right, um, we will move on here to a case study. So I'll invite a few other folks to the a few other folks to the uh, stage here. So we got Nils and Craig. Awesome. Um, so quick, quick ways of introduction. I'll, I'll let each of you guys do a brief introduction yourself here. So um, Craig's a principal scientist here at, at, at BAE Systems. Uh, he's conducted eight years of research on topics ranging from high energy, condensed matter, atomic physics, um, and, and Craig has a PhD in physics from Penn State University. Um, Nils, Nils Levine is a program manager and project manager with Cold Quanta. Um, a quantum computing company, I think a lot of you guys may have heard about, they were one of the X-Tech Search 5 finalists. Um, and Nils is a West Point graduate and specializes in business transformation and systems engineering. Um, so I, I guess to get started, the, the first question I have, you know, just to tell the story, you know, Nils, I'd love to hear, you know, your version of the story. Hey, how, how, did the, how did the partnership start? You know, walk us through what was going on in your head, how you first made contact with BAE and figured out, hey, maybe it's worth doing some sort of technical integration project with them. Sure. So uh, um, just a little bit of background on what Cold Quanta does. So they're, they're, we, we have some unique capabilities that I believe uh, uh, BAE Systems uh, found uh, interesting. Uh, what we do is uh, we're focused on all things quantum. Uh, so we're uh, involved in cold atom technology, which is a very scalable and versatile and commercially viable quantum method for using quantum uh, capabilities to do lots of different things. Quantum computing, uh, clocks, uh, RF sensing. Uh, and so some of those capabilities, which are very unique and can be transformational uh, as we go forward, you know, especially the way Craig and I are working in the, the RF sensing uh, uh, capabilities of quantum, uh, we have, you know, 100 people here at Cold Quantum, but most of them are PhDs over 300 years of experience in, in quantum uh, technology. Um, most companies don't have that. Uh, what we don't have is the large system integrator capabilities that somebody like a BAE Systems has. Uh, they do some things obviously in, in RF sensing and things like that. So uh, over a number of years, uh, d discussions uh, went on and uh, finally we found the great, uh, uh, a couple of great opportunities to, to work on. Awesome, great, thanks Nils. Um, Craig, I'm, I'm wondering what, what's your perspective, you know, kind of rep representing the types of things you care about from the large integrator perspective, you know, I, I'm sure, especially to set the stage, you know, you, you know, you have a PhD, I'm sure BAE does a lot of their interesting research internally, you know, so to tell me, you know, what's in your head and your thought process here when it comes to, hey, maybe we should look to partner with someone that's not BAE. Sure, yeah, thanks for having me, Will. Um, so in BAE, there's a, there's a kind of a, a smaller um, R&D organization called, called Fast Labs. It's a, I think altogether it's, it's like 800 people that, that that constitute the R and D organization for all of Fast Labs, um, and uh, and so yeah, BAE has a history of of doing many things electronic warfare related, um, RF systems, radar, um, all sorts of countermeasures, um, lasers, 
things like that. Um, so, so yes, my, my, my background is, uh, is quantum physics, atomic physics, and I had joined BAE, you know, a few years ago and, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, as, as I've been work as I've been working in BAE and kind of the other quantum, um, experts have been in BAE, you know, we've been trying to, uh, you know, think about ways that, that, uh, that, that quantum could really help, um, the warfighter. And, 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 you know, if, if there are opportunities that align with the uh, specific interests of BAE, um, yeah, and things like that. So there's a, um, you know, while that kind of thinking is going on, there's a, um, there's also another, you know, sub team in the, in our uh, R and D organization, which are kind of technology scouts, um, where you know they go out and try and try to find other small businesses or, or small businesses uh, that have interesting technology that that you know seem aligned with with um, with uh, you know current interests uh, that BAE is is, is looking into. Um, so a, a lot of times, you know, BAE is a big big company. Um, but but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have an infinite number of of dollars or or or, or you know research interests. Um, you know we specialize in the, into the things that that you know we we can do well. Uh, and uh, and as a biz, big business um, doesn't necessarily turn quickly towards uh, towards exciting new opportunities. Uh, you know and it's never as, as quick as anybody would like. Um, so, so these, techno these technology scouts are definitely looking, actively looking for other small businesses to try to uh, work together. Um, you know, they, they are typically more, tim more nimble uh, and, and often have, you know, world-class experts uh, in, in those fields. So, so, this, uh, so from our perspective, um, this, our story kind of started back in, I think it was late 2017, uh, where that kind of... Um, Technology Scout got a hold of Colquana and said, "Hey, look, this is you know they're developing interesting technology. Uh, is there anything that that BAE can 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 work with them?" Uh, and so at the time, you know the people involved, uh, you know, had some discussions, um, uh, had some phone calls, and uh, I think we met over the year over a few different years, uh, you know, at conferences and things. But there weren't, you know, there weren't any. Kind of great opportunities at the time um, that uh, that we thought we could really collaborate on, um, and so that was kind of uh, on the back burner for uh, a couple, you know, 2017, 18, 19, um, and it wasn't until uh, uh, recently. So uh, the DARPA has a quantum apertures program uh, that that really kind of fit the niche. Um, and, uh, and and that's kind of where where our, our, the the real you know, contact and uh, and and working together with Colquana started, uh, in, you know, with uh, with real uh, more serious crowd money, basically. Yeah, very very interesting. Can you crystallize what you just said there, Craig? Really good point about you know, like sometimes the relationship is is helpful. You know, it has to be there over many years, right? Which is it can be tough for a small business, right, to nurture a relationship of that scale. Um, but I'm curious, you know, can you help uh, again signal? What exactly, you know, the, the signal, demand signal was that then, you know, said, hey, okay, now we can actually fund, right, and do a funded partnership with Cold Quanta. Uh, well, I mean, so it, it's all about having a lot of contacts and networking and uh, and trying to uh, keep abreast of all the opportunities. Um, you know, it, it's hard to get more specific than that. But in, in our specific case, it was uh, <clears throat> that. Uh, there was there was an opportunity to to do this, do this um, RF sensing using atomic physics, build this kind of new novel device, and um, so BAE had invested a little bit of money into trying to develop this, you know, try and flesh it out and see like is this really promising? Do we really think this is this is you know high risk high reward? Emphasis on the high reward part, and um, the. Uh, uh, so there was some shaping with the DARPA PMs, and uh, and lo and behold, the, you know those DARPA PMs were, were actually pretty interested in uh, in the idea they had been working on this program. So, you know, when that BAA, BAA came out, and we saw, hey, hey, this is this is you know exactly this is atomic physics um, science that it, that they're calling for to develop, and we know that. A, a, a one of the you know a world class leader in in quantum atomic physics devices 
you know, let's see if uh, if we can, you know, if we can really get the details together, and, and if this is a, a great complementary activity. So, uh, you know, and then you know, in full disclosure, you know, we had some conversations with, with other um, other bigger companies or other uh, research labs, but you know, Colquana had capabilities that BAE, BAE does not, um, and uh, and, Col uh, and and we have capabilities that Colquana does not. Um, and, uh, and so there was, it was, it was really a great match. Um, so I, yeah. I, I guess, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a great opportunity and, and, uh, and, you know, you just, you just keep your, your doors open, um, and make sure that you, you always talk to people. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that, Craig. And I'll, and I'll highlight just to translate some, something specific, I think for all the small businesses out there, right. You know, Craig mentioned, hey, you know, it was waiting. DARPA was one of the specific customers for BAE, right? So, you know, takeaway there, try to empathize with who the customers of the large prime might be. You know, like if you can try to understand what their larger demand, you know, if you paid attention to DARPA and you see them, you know, publish, you know, hey, we'd, we'd love large scaled up, you know, quantum prototypes. Maybe you don't have the scaled up part, you have the quantum science, right? Okay, maybe you should re reach out to that um, corporate contact. So, uh, thanks for that one, Craig. Nils, one of the companies came in the chat here. How, how did Cold Quanta initially get in touch with BAE? Any specifics, respond to a website, LinkedIn, meeting an event? Can you go a little bit deeper on what, how that, what that first contact was like? I believe that first contact was between uh, our CTO and uh, uh, I'm not sure what Marco is at uh, BAE, but uh, I think of your- He's a chief scientist. Chief scientist, yeah. uh, you know, kind of uh, roaming around in the same circles, at uh, uh, DARPA events and, and and other things that are in kind of our wheelhouse of uh, uh, of interests. Obviously, BAE has more, but but uh, you know, meeting there, uh, us understanding that uh, you know at some point, uh, if if we do want to get these things on, you know, something that has you know an F in its nomenclature. Or, or something like that. We're going to need to get with a, uh, a, a big prime uh, for that. So uh, just kind of reaching out to uh, a, a various number of people uh, in in the circles of technology that you know we find ourselves as as, as being you know somewhat influential in. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So it's, you know a lot of a lot of personal uh, interactions, and then you know trying to take it. Uh, uh, further and looking for for genuine opportunities where, you know, I think, uh, I, you know, I've been looking at the chat too, and and, and there's a lot of grumbling, and, and I I totally get it because I've been there uh, too, and in other companies, uh, you know, how do you get people to look at you and and things like that, um, you know, you gotta you gotta work in in your wheelhouse. Uh, and, uh, and 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 have the vision to be able to see you know where this stuff uh, really can transition realistically because we all think you know hey geez I should have some kind of a quantum device in my coaster you know it just doesn't make sense you know so um, yeah I think you yeah, have very good point I like I like the point that's something we we try to reiterate as well from our perspective you know running small business accelerators is hey. Got to figure out what your secret sauce is, right? And, and and double down, triple down on that versus trying to say you can do every single thing in the whole wide world, right? It makes it difficult for someone like Craig to, to mentally figure out what you actually are good at, right? Um, but it make it helps you, you know, double down on those resources. Another another good question came in, um, you know, for, for you again, Nils. But um, when when you guys were doing this, could you walk through some of the tacticals in terms of you know when when Cold Pond is ready to invest in the partnering? Was this something that uh, you know, your role was managing like kind of core billable projects within Cold Quanta. You just happened to show up at a conference. Is this something that was, hey, we hired a full time kind of business development person? Was, you know, was this, hey, you know, we're going to make the intentional decision with our, I know you guys were venture funded to spend some venture funding on you know, going after the defense market. But could you get a little more tactical too on like, what does it take from a business perspective? If I'm a small business, what should I be budgeting for in the future when I'm ready for this step? Sure. Um, and, and just, you know, full disclosure. A lot of this happened before uh, I got to uh, uh, to Cold Quana, so this is, you know, but uh, it, we, we do have uh, venture funding, and I, I do want to make a comment to Dr. Willis uh, uh, about venture funding and, and the ability to participate in Army SBIRs, especially if you're uh, standing up accelerators and things like that. But uh, but we were bootstrapped. I mean, we were 
uh, a uh, an SBIR company uh, kind of from the the, the beginning. Uh, uh, we did have uh, you know our CTO, uh, Dr. Dana Anderson, came out of uh, Jilla at the University of Colorado, so that carries a lot of uh, cachet. Uh, and, and things like that, you know, I know trying to make that first big splash to be able to, you know, get on somebody's radar and, and getting on like a BAE's radar where they'll, where they'll return a call or, or even look at you um, is, uh, you know, takes, takes some effort. Uh, you know, uh, how is it done? You know, through a lot of events and, and, and things like that and reaching out, uh, you know, uh, the first time, uh, uh, you know, as as Craig said, it took a while uh, to to have this this work um, between BAE and and Cold Quana. You know, you you do you have to you, you have to keep keep at it and and nurture it. Uh, you know, unless you have you know something out of the box that you know is ready to scale right away, it's going to be very hard to. Uh, uh, to get a prime to to you know a large prime to just you know jump on uh, sometimes I'm not saying it can happen but in, in in my experience because I've been in other small businesses that have been involved in SBIRs uh, you know you, you got to make a you know a big enough splash where you, where you can get noticed and it is it's going to events um, it is spending some BNP money trying to get uh, uh, Good proposals out there, um, you know. I will say, you know, the SBIR program is 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 a great way of doing that. There are advantages to a large prime to be on an SBIR program. Um, you know, it's a uh, as it was you know Dr. Willis said, it's a it's a pretty light lift on a, a proposal. Uh, but there are other things like. IP generation and data rights and and stuff like that that are that are part of the SBIR program that you know should be of interest. They're they're definitely of interest to us as a small business. So I'm I'm sure they're just as interesting to a large business. If you can get paid, uh, you know, to generate IP and and things like that, it just goes into your portfolio. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I appreciate it. Great, great, great story there, Nils. And I think really good tactical advice for, for everyone who's paying attention there of, of exactly how to think through that from an operator perspective. So um, with that, we're, we're kind of coming up on time. I'm Craig, I'm just curious, any any other kind of general takeaways from this experience that you think would be uh, helpful to share with the audience here about, you know, kind of what it's like, what it feels like, you know, tips for small businesses in the audience about how to, you know, think about partnering with with, with organizations that you represent? So I guess I can't, uh, I can't speak for the other primes. Uh, I've only worked at BAE, um, but I, I, I would say that, uh, you know, they're, they're organizations just, you know, of people just like uh, a small business is. And, um, and, and yeah, you know, if you have a technology that, that, uh, that the person you're talking to, you know, can understand and can, uh, can see the, the the promise um you know they're 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 bound to be interested if if there's some way that that they can fit it in with the, with their own business strategy um so you know it, it might take some effort to try and find the right person or the right group to to talk to but you know in my experience with with the r d group that i'm uh, a part of you know everybody's always looking for for new technology and they're, and they're it's absolutely um uh, are always interested in in you know new ideas and new people coming to us or, or whatever. I mean, there are there are people dedicated to to, to trying to to find new technology for the broader research organization. Um, so there, there's oftentimes you know uh, willing ears, uh, um, but it might be hard to find them. Um, yeah, I guess you just need to keep to keep trying. And then secondly, the other potentially frustrating part might be that. Um, uh, you might not gain traction if you know the the, the perfect storm doesn't uh, doesn't you know arise, which is uh, you know a funding opportunity, and uh, it, it aligns with a business strategy of that of that prime, um, and uh, uh, and then also your technology that that you have you know seems like uh, you know it, it's ahead of what anybody else has, or uh, certainly what the prime has uh, is working on. Um, so, I, anyways, I would say that I, I would say that one should be optimistic uh, that 
um, you know, in my experience, and um, and also from my experience, you know, we we are definitely, you know, trying to work with the small businesses. We 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 don't try to, uh, you know, blow them over um, and and take all their IP. You know, the, you know, it's part of the contract negotiations, but it's generally, you know, what what you develop, you keep, um, you know, within the greater uh, contractual. You know, army uh, requirements for that for that particular contract. Yeah, wonderful. They're, they're very helpful there, Craig and and uh, Nils. Any what, something small to add there? Or? I, uh, well, I just if if we were getting off, I just wanted to uh, follow up with my comment to uh, Dr. Willis. You know, is as you're looking at accelerators and incubators and things like that, uh, that also implies you know primes and and other folks are going to invest in small businesses. And uh, if you can uh, uh, look at uh, the VC funding issue with uh, being able to participate in the SBIR program, um, it's a great program. Uh, you know, I just, it, it, as you get VC funding, it, it, it locks you out of certain things, uh, even though you're still uh, pretty small, so. Yeah, yeah, good, good comment, and definitely another issue we could uh, go deeper into more in depth another day. So appreciate that, Nils. So a huge thanks to to Craig and Nils for for joining us today. Um, we're going to move on now to our, our next panel. So so thanks, guys. Great, great kind of takeaways and anecdotes there to share on kind of what it's like to actually do one of the partnerships. So we're going to move on here and invite some other folks from large firms that represent the kind of dedicated people who are looking to partner with small businesses and innovative technology. So. Um, I'll kind of quickly introduce them and then just jump right into questions. We're in a little bit behind in schedule. So, um, Tony Marash is the Director of Strategy at L3 Harris Space and Airborne Systems. Tony's got extensive experience mentoring startups in the defense space and has an MBA from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, Gil Gonzalez is a tech scout here with BAE Systems. Uh, Gil is a project management expert and served in the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, Gil's decorated career also involves stops at GE Aviation and MIT's Lincoln Labs. And Gil is a technical, has a technical background with a master's degree in electrical engineering. Mackenzie Manning is a program manager with Raytheon Technologies working on their Boomerang program. Uh, Mackenzie was formerly with Pratt & Whitney um, and is an experienced project management professional in the aerospace and defense industry and holds an MBA from Villanova University. So, uh, Tony, Gil, Mackenzie, thanks, thanks y'all for joining. Um, we'll kind of jump right to right into it here and um, we'll get we'll go with Tony since he's on the far left of the screen here um, but I, it, to start we'll just go left to right here but I, I'd love to hear you know what's the carrot for working with a prime you know from your perspective what are the resources that a large prime a large corporation has you know that a small business likely doesn't have that you know you, you know just talking and you know some long-term partnership um, you know is going to be valuable to you I'd, I'd love to start with Tony and just hear your perspective of what those resources that L3 has There we go. Sorry, working with the mute button there. Uh, hey, great to be here. Well, good to see you again. Um, I think for us, it's it's sort of the um, it's something we need to improve on. I'll say that I won't bury the lead and, and say that when we think about the mentor protege programs, there's a long way to go. So that I understand that the carrot looks uh, looks challenging from from a distance. I think ultimately it's the things you'd probably expect. We have program exposure. Um, when I think about my business, which is space space vehicles. The ground telescopes, EW, mission avionics, and so forth. Um, we do have quite a bit of exposure to some of the responsive space concepts that are still um, not necessarily open to the commercial side. So what we can offer is 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 absolutely program exposure, the path to getting on the program of record, which is what we're all trying to do. The second element is to um, to really have. I think the government still struggles to transfer transition over from either phase two or phase three into an actual program of record. I don't think that's that's pretty well documented. We can be helpful on on, on that side where we, we can at least be an in-house resource by which you partner and you work with us until um, either a commercial market evolves or, or, or materializes. And the third is just to underline how, how I, I mean, this is the why we're all here. It, defense technologies remain exquisite. I, I know that when we say COTS, we don't mean COTS. We mean these are still we don't mean we don't mean simple. They can be cots, but they're still very exquisite. Um, the level of sophistication that has to that we still have to get through to get to the battlefield, whether it's in any domain, is still pretty remarkable. And and our mission expertise as a prime, um, and I've worked at Lockheed Martin and now over over here as well, is still the thing that we we are going to bring to the fight. We want 
we want to bring the technology ecosystem into that fight, but the sophistication and the level that we need to get to to actually prove out that TRL is is still something I think we understand best over here, Will. Yeah, yeah, a great comment. I think in line with what, what's been said a few other times too, just the, the level of personnel or organ, organ, necessary organizational bureaucracy, understanding the customer deployment strategies, right? It's it's much more nuanced than performing a technical scope of work on a cyber contract, right? And that, that's some of the you know intrinsic knowledge that an organization at large will have. So thanks for the comment there. Gil, over, over to you. What resources does BAE Systems provide when, you know, in terms of the carrot for coming to talk and work with you? Yeah, so, um, you know, so one of, one of the things like, like Craig had mentioned earlier is uh, my role is a technology scout. My role is to, is to look outside of BAE for that technology um, and, and see if we can find some partners, right? And, and partners is, is, is a key word here, right? So this is, this is part of the helping uh, where we're not looking to absorb anybody's IP in any kind of way, right? So I know there's, there's typically a fear of that that's out there um our our role and, and i'll tell you from our our president of electronic systems to our vp of fast labs and our product line directors will tell you the same same thing we're not looking to take anybody's ip um we are looking to partner with companies find those small businesses um pull them in integrate with the technology that we are developing because likely it's going to be some kind of an integration and, um, and utilize that technology for our business units on programs of record. Um, so, so, you know, that, that's kind of the path there. It, it takes a while, okay? So just to let folks know, it doesn't take six months, right? It takes years for that to really happen uh, because you're talking about embedding another technology into a program of record, right? So I've, I've been looking through the chat and I see, you know, somebody commented about, you know, programs of records and primes and, you know, the Army giving all the contracts. Well, those big programs of record are large programs. You can have thousands, you know, thousands or thousands of people on a program, right, um, that to, to manage that program of record, right? A small business can't tackle that. That would bury you. Um, and so, um, so by, by, by trying to integrate that, that technology in, we actually have to coordinate with the DOD, with that, that uh, customer on a contract mod to bring that technology in. You can't just stick it in there, right? And go, here you go, here's a, here's a new technology. Um, it all has to be done contractually, right? So there's a lot that happens there and it takes time, right? So we ha actually have to evaluate the technology that the small business has, see how well it fits within our por portfolio, right? Because if you look at, you know, L3 Harris, Raytheon, and BAE systems, the portfolios are different, right? We have different areas of expertise. Um, and so we need to make sure we align to that portfolio. Then once we, we agree that we, you know, we may have an alignment there, we've got to then work with our uh, internal folks and our, um, you know, the small business that we're working with to, to lay down a plan for how we're gonna bring that technology uh, in and and start working it and, and pull some funding together for that right and which takes time again right and then we have to you chances are you're working several programs or projects before you even get to the program record right and in some cases it won't it may not get to the program record because we will find that it doesn't really completely work out and we have to maybe rethink uh rethink it and, and go back to the table right so um, so, so part of that is, you know, engaging with us is, you know, as, as a startup or small company, you can, you can reach out to us, the technology scout, um, you know, there are different sources, uh, ways to reach into, uh, VA systems, but you can reach out to us. Um, you can ping me on LinkedIn if you have to, right? So I've had several people do that. That's fine. Um, and then I'll kind of transition you over to work email. Uh, and then we can, we can talk about what the possibilities are. Okay. And, and see, see what we can do. Okay. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Gil. Um, Mackenzie, uh, you know, that same kind of question to you. What, what types of resources are Raytheon or, you know, what's the carrot for small businesses to come talk to you? Absolutely. It's a lot of uh, what um, Gil and Tony mentioned, right? There's a lot of people power at these big companies, at these prime contractors, and uh, they are, we are very well versed in talking to our customers and putting uh, value propositions together in order to go through the process of doing those contract modifications 
to bring new technology to the platforms that we work on. And so um, also, as Gil mentioned, a lot of our portfolios are very diverse and we have an opportunity to reach out with multiple different um, Department of Defense customers um, and tap into networks that small businesses really don't have the, the bandwidth uh, to keep hitting the pavement to talk to those folks. So there's a lot of benefit in partnering with a large prime uh, like Raytheon or BAE or L3 Harris to um, bring the power of those uh, companies, but also bring the new technologies that are being incubated in these small businesses to ultimately serve the end goal, which is a uh, well-prepared and armed uh, Department of Defense. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, a lot of good common themes here. And again, if you know people, there, there's lots of large defense primes out there. I think we have, we have three of the ones that are more active in this space to actively, you know, connect with you. Again, you know, like Gil, you know, everyone's saying, hey, connect with me personally, right? That you know, just think about the investment that is on behalf of the prime, right? To work with a small business. So um, again, there's resource out there. That, you know, these three represent really good resources. And I think for explaining some of the you know the, the consistent resources available, what that carrot looks like. Um, I'll, I'll kind of target the next few questions here. Um, Gil, I'll go straight to you on this one, but can you walk through kind of the criteria you're looking for when you, especially, not necessarily we get the, you know, it's helpful to kind of know and talk to as many folks as possible, but when you think about, okay, you know, I kind of know a company's ready for the big leagues to actually do a formal, you know, potential paid and subcontract partnership with the BAE systems. What does that look like? Is it size of company, business maturity, a technical readiness level? Can you can you walk us through a little bit? Hey, what is that kind of ready to partner, um, you know, small business look like from your perspective? Yeah, sure. So, um, um, so good point there. Um, one thing I want to point out, right? Is that you notice uh, everybody on the panel here, we all have MBAs, right? So, um, and and that's for a reason. Um, it's it's because. Um, one needs to kind of understand the business side of things, right? I mean, I grew, grew up as a, you know, uh, in uniform and as an engineer, right? But I realized, hey, having an, an MBA and really understanding business is is going to be beneficial um, in in these kinds of roles. Um, so, so obviously, the the one person company, um, huge challenge, right? That it, it's a big risk. Um, so, um, so that you know, that's where my advice is going to be. Okay. Grow a little bit, you know. Um, go after some sivers um, and, and develop a little bit. The other thing is, is the technology is only conceptual. Um, that's another thing that's that's very risky. Um, so, so I'll, I'll tell you. So, from from a fast labs perspective, where Craig talked about fast labs, uh, where we do our R and D work, uh, you know, we can take in low TRL. And, and work with that business to mature it, right? Um, I mean, I could even go down to maybe TRL two or so and, and still work with that business. Um, but the higher the TRL, the better, right? Um, obviously, I'm not looking for a small business to come in with TRL seven, right? Um, it's, it's, it's very unlikely and we're gonna weed out a lot of capable technology if we, if we um, target that. So, um, but part of our evaluation process is to look at the, the maturity of the technology and see what can we do together to mature that technology. We've got thunderstorms going on here if you hear it, um, uh, to mature it and get it to that high enough TRL so we can transition it over to a business unit. Um, so, uh, so I'd say that's that's you know the technical criteria. Um, obviously, we've talked about alignment to the portfolio, right? Um, I'm not going to. Um, you know, the, the electronic systems sector of BAE systems doesn't necessarily, isn't a, a, a big provider of platforms. We tend to provide subsystems to companies like Raytheon or L3 Harris or Lockheed, right? We do that all the time, um, working together. So we're looking, we're, we're going to look for um, those technologies that fit within that portfolio we have and we can actually bring them in as if you, you, you know, sub subsystems, if you will, right? Um, and, and, and look at that, that capability. Um, and then, uh, like I said, so then from a business perspective, um, I'm actually going to do a little homework and research on that company. I'm going to find out who's investing in you, um, when you got investment funding, um, what you've been doing, what kind of you know, what news there is on you. I'm going to go do that digging because I need to understand that you're going to be um, 
a viable enough business to continue doing some work with us, right? Um, obviously, we want you to succeed, um, and, and, and we want you to succeed commercially and in the DOD space. Um, and, and the reason for that is it de-risks us, our, our, um, our programs, when you, as a startup or small business, have other work that's going. I don't. Hey, you, you can go do the. You can use the same technology with uh, Raytheon and L3 Harris. I don't mind, right? As long as you know you've got other customers and you're you're generating revenue, I'm good with that, right? So I'm going to look at that and see: Are you gener generating revenue? If you are, it, it may be small, but where is it? Where is it at? And then and then how are you targeting your commercial sector, right? Um, that's the other thing: Are you targeting commercial and DoD, or are you trying to do one at a time? Sometimes I tell companies, you're better off, go to the commercial side, develop, and then come back. Yeah. Just because I think they'll bury themselves if they're trying to tackle both. And I and that I think they've got a better market um, in the commercial side. Sometimes I'll say that. Yeah. So, really good long point. answer. Yeah. No, really, really good point. I just want to re highlight the, the dual use nature of the business growth plan and, and how, how powerful that is for companies. Um, and even, you know, like there's a question in the chat, I'll, I'll just kind of answer on, on y'all's behalf here, but um, you know, what limitations could VC money have for potential working? And it, it comes down to the kind of the due diligence on who's investing in your company, right? So it's not necessarily that venture capital investment is a bad thing, but if that venture capital, you know, comes from, you know, di different countries that the U.S. doesn't like doing business with, presents some major risks for, you know, for some of these larger defense contractors uh, in the organizations you see here. So just quickly answer that one. Um, Mackenzie, I wonder if you can answer here. Good question about, you know, I think in all reason we frame it a little bit. The question is, how do how do you, how does your organization publicly post that you're looking for tech? And um, you know, if it does at all. And I think the the other question is, what kind of homework can someone do even without talking to you guys, right? You know, again, because we we we've, we've talked about how valuable and important and hard it is to build a relationship. Is there anything you know I could I could have an analyst do some research to figure out if my tech lines up with Raytheon? Absolutely. So Raytheon's obviously a very big company and um, getting bigger by the year. And we have a lot of diverse platforms and uh, offerings to uh, the U.S. government. And so, um, you know, I I do not actually know if we publish uh, the technology that we're looking for um, to to organizations that may be looking to partner with us. But I do know that a lot of times. Uh, the contracts that we're going after are one very widely publicized um, through press releases and are are covered in, in defense news all over the world. Um, and we tend to stay within those spaces, right? So, um, you know, for example, uh, my most recent uh, company before this, I worked for Pratt and Whitney. I worked on the F thirty five program um, as well as other development programs. It's very clear. Uh, that Pratt & Whitney is going after those sorts of programs uh, through news articles and things like that. And so anything that you can do to find publicly released information about the technology that um, our organization is currently offering and make a value proposition be able to be um, a partner with us in delivering more capability to our customers, um, the program offices would be more than willing to have those conversations. And our supply chain organization um, is the one where we really uh, facilitate those conversations with potential partners and small businesses to partner with to fulfill our contracting obligations for our small business partnerships on some of these large contracts and programs of record. Wonderful. Yeah, and, and great point. You addressed one of the other questions is questions there about kind of the balancing the alignment to a program record and meeting the small business requirement, right? It is a uh, Probably not as mechanical a thing, you know, it requires a lot of smart people thinking critically about how to, how to, you know, manage traditional suppliers, small business suppliers as partners on major programs of record. So appreciate answering that one too. Um, Tony, I'm wondering if you can, um, you know, talk a little bit more about, are there any barriers from your perspective that could be alleviated by anyone? Again, you know, we, we're, we're, we talk, we're here today to talk about the applied cyber, trying to alleviate some of those barriers and build better connectivity, but you know, what other barriers do you face, you know, that small businesses can gain the kind of empathy for what a large prime goes through and try to, you know, work and, and identify these more innovative small businesses to partner with? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Well, I, I kind of start, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll piggyback on what McKinsey said about, <clears throat> we try to be specific about our strategy. That's my job, right? And, and so the way that I translate that for the businesses, 
I have, I'll, I'll give the space systems as an example. We have a, a framework, a make by partner framework that sits on one slide that says at a, at a strategic level, these are the things we want to make by partner. Uh, and then at the value chain level, you know, the, the all, you know, left of launch all the way through launch, here are the pieces of the value chain. We want to own the things that we don't. You may not know that level of detail, but it's pretty clear. It, it may be clear from public sources, the types of phenomenologies we have in space on payloads, the types of things we don't have. And if you think about what we're trying to do in space, which is to be a responsive prime, I'm not hiding the, burying the lead from my competitors here, my competitor mates. Um, we have specific needs and on the technology side, they're going to enable us on certain evolving missions like missile warning, missile defense. We have some things, we don't have some things. So I think there's, you don't know the inside baseball, but you get pretty close. Um, we try to, we're not public about the technologies per se, but we're very public about the, the strategy um, and the capabilities we do have. Um, it, it, the other side is it, sometimes it's the, the boundary or the obstacle I'll say is sometimes it's just challenging to be, to be honest with each other. Um, I think Gil mentioned it, it takes a long time. It, you know, when you think about about um, what it means to get on the prime calendar. And I did some F-35 work back in my time as McKinsey did too. When you think about what it takes to get a technology onto that platform and the years and years and years that it takes and the, the, the readiness level that it takes, that you've got to get a contracting officer to buy into that concept, get money into, or get a requirement into this year's POM so that it can be paid for a year and a half from now. I know you all know that, but that's that's the challenge that we face if there's some empathy where you will mention it. We are not trying to steal IP. I don't think, you know, we're, we're definitely not trying to do that. We're not trying to take equity. And I'll talk about that one in a minute, if you don't mind, because there are instances in which I think there's some creativity here. Um, but if the empathy is, you know, we never want to say we're being slow. The government is working really hard to adjust and give us author opportunities and different transaction authorities to be able to move quicker. They're giving us a lot more license to do experimentation and demos and exercises that we maybe wouldn't have had license before. So that's the that's the context. The other thing meaning we are all trying, des trying desperately to do things like digital acquisition, by which we give you a digital model for the, the competition instead of the stack of paper. The technology and all enablers where we, whereby we could sort of plug and play on those types of uh, our efforts make, make a lot of sense. The last thing I'll say there is the government has a long way to go on on helping us in, in this regard. We are not, to, we're not blameless, but, but we all know that the traditional acquisition methods that exist, exist for some, some reason. They've come along for some reason. They're not going away so much, but I think we're gonna to continue to see this churn and this swirl until we can kind of help each other out, especially on software-based acquisition, some of the more challenging things. Um, and I'm sorry, well, the last thing I'll say is one of our, one of the preferred tools that we've been trying to use a little bit more lately for some later, slightly later stage, stage companies than the audience today is taking equity stakes for uh, specific exclusivity. So we'll, we'll, of your portfolio of technologies, we'll say, we want that thing at that aperture, at that band. We'll give, what, what do you think for that thing? And that's, that's where we'll be very specific, especially as companies grow a little bit. And then we can be very helpful and say, we don't want to redirect your whole company in our method. We just want that thing because we think that has great potential up in space or in the airborne domain. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, great, great. You addressed, I think, another question that was asked in the chat. Um, we'll go ahead and finish up. I'd, I'd love to pass it just back to Gil and Mackenzie. If you guys have any, you know, other information to share with kind of the small businesses in the audience about kind of partnering, um, if you just take 30 seconds each and, and you know, any final takeaways or information, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and finish up after that. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things I'd like to throw out there is, you know, um, we don't always have all the answers either, right? Um, I mean, if you look at the size of our BD organizations, we spend millions of dollars a year. Not that, not that I want to cut out our BD organizations or anything, but we spend millions of dollars a year just to really understand and figure out what the DOD wants. Okay, now think about that, right? So now, what would where, where I think it'd be much more beneficial is if we can actually have those conversations with the small businesses and startups and the primes and the DOD about what they're trying to do to some enough detail, right, that they're not giving away the secrets, right, enough detail so that we can all then up front early on figure out how to uh, shape or how to um, lay down a strategy 
for solving that problem, right? Um, and we could save time by doing that, right? Uh, by, by all being at the table together in, in some way that's well communicated, right? Where, you know, you don't need to have BD folks kicking down the door all day, every day, just to try to figure it out, right? Um, let them focus on other things that, that are maybe more, more crucial, uh, that are crucial to the company. So awesome. I, I guess I'd like to throw that out there. Great comment. And just again, to re-highlight, you know, that's one of the things Matt mentioned directly with the Applied Cyber Program is they're, you know, trying to bring those customers into the discussion and really to build that kind of connectivity, you know, from within the Army. So great comment, Gil. Um, Mackenzie, any final comments before we move on to the um, the pitches? Thank you. So uh, a couple of things I just wanted to touch on, right? And I think that uh, you said it best when you mentioned uh, the, the acquisition structure is there for a reason, but it's not necessarily... Uh, in favor of agile acquisition. And um, the, the system is really set up for competition. And competition makes us better, but I think we're synergizing around the fact that cooperation is what makes us best. And as the defense industry, I think it's very important that we come together and inform our customer about what we can do to help them move forward. And so, um, you know, some of the best advice that I heard is find out what your customer wants and gives it, give it to them. And that's not always what they ask for. Uh, oftentimes it's very much not what they ask for. And so using our, um, especially our small businesses and our technology incubators to inform best practices and great technologies on the battlefield of tomorrow, um, I think is a great opportunity for us to synergize uh, together and talk to our customers together. So um, I think that folks are looking for a way to to kind of break down some of those barriers and talking to some of uh, the folks who work in primes. I uh, can think of a number of ways to start engaging. I think some contact information has been provided already in the chat, but also and some websites have already been provided in the chat. Um, but one um, thing not to underestimate is the value of some of these trade shows and a lot of the primes are um, um, uh, have booths. That's not the right word. They have booths at the uh, these trade shows, and a lot of their business development organizations. But also, people were looking for contacts with program managers, and a lot of program managers are either at the booth or they're there walking around um, some of these large trade shows. And so, by focusing maybe some dollars, some time uh, to go to some of those activities would be well worth it for some organizations. Wonderful. Great. Just a great, great comment just about customer discovery. At the end of the day, we're all, it's all, you know, kind of working backwards from there. We're all different players in the game. So I um, appreciate it, Mackenzie. Um, great. So we'll, we'll keep our awesome panelists up here on stage to kind of be judges for, you know, feedback guests for the, these cohort one pitches. And I'd like to hand it over as, you know, for the MC uh, responsibilities here to my colleague, Mike Bynum. Mike leads our applied cyber acceleration progress at FedTech. And to clarify here, our role at FedTech with the applied cyber program is to support all the awardees of the program. And we have a variety of ways, happy to go deeper and you can go on our website to learn more there. Uh, but we're, you know, we're proud partners of the program here and Mike leads a lot of the work that we do with the awardees to help them, one, become super healthy, sustainable dual use ventures, and two, transition that tech to the end customer and in, in, in large scale impact in the warfighter. So I'll hand it over to Mike and thanks to our panelists and everyone for uh, participating in the discussions earlier. All right, thank you, Will. And uh, I appreciate the panel sticking around. Uh, Mackenzie, Tony, great to see you again. Gil, I have yet to meet you in person, but definitely look forward to doing it. So uh, let's get to why we're all here today. We, we want to highlight and, and showcase, um, you know, the early stage companies uh, to give them their best shot. So uh, today we've got seven companies that are going to pitch. And um, look, I'm going to throw them on the hot seat. They're going to pitch and then going to open it up for questions. So uh, next slide, please. So Chad, uh, you, you are first on the hot seat. Are you ready to go? Ready to go. Okay, so uh, we've got Helicoid first up with Chad presenting. Chad, you're on the seat. Great, thanks. And somebody will uh, work the presentation? Absolutely. Uh, I'm Chad Wasilankoff, founder and CEO of Helicoid Industries. We have technology, it's basically platform technology that will improve the performance of all composites. Next slide. So the inspiration for our technology is actually from nature. 
It came from this mantis shrimp. So this shrimp evolved over hundreds of millions of years. It has these dactyl clubs that smash prey. Uh, it's faster than a 22 caliber bullet. It actually boils and cavitates the water. And it's the internal structure in these clubs that gives it this incredible performance, not the material. So we've now emulated that and are now applying it and commercializing it into composite materials. Next slide. So the research has been conducted by over 70 researchers at 16 different universities in collaboration for 14 years. Since that work has begun, they've also identified 50 other organisms that have high performance characteristics, and they too have evolved with this helicoid architecture. And we spent 12 million developing this. It's now patented here in California, and we've now filed several other additional patents for manufacturing processes. Next slide. So as I said, it's not the material, but it's the structure. So you take sheets of parallel fibers, and then you rotate the next layer to the right or to the left, and then keep that rotation going. In terms of understanding the basic physics behind it, if you have a normal architecture where the fibers cross at 90 degrees, there's a very small square in the middle there or surface area to transfer energy. If you have a shallow angle, a lot more surface area, you can dissipate that energy and materially improve the performance. Next slide. So when we compare, compare that performance with what it would considered the world's leading architecture using the aerospace entry at industry at zero plus minus 45 and 90 degrees by using the same material, the same resin, the same manufacturing process, but just applying the helicoid, these are the kinds of benefits we can get. We can delay catastrophic failure by 74%, impact strength by 50%, load bearing by 92%, transverse load, again, in-plane surface delamination, again, that's that energy dissipation, we can more than double that. Even after an impact, we can improve the compression strength by 20% and through thickness damage by 50%. Next slide. So how does this apply to the defense market and more specific uses? Obviously, we offer higher impact resistance, which is critical to guarantee the protection against external threats. Obviously, a lot of things within the military have uh, very rough terrains, difficult environments, and go through a lot of various uh, types of impacts. So our technology is currently at, at least a TRL-5, depending on the product and shape and configuration and application, and manufacturer readiness level, readiness level 6. So the focus areas for our SBI is starting with the howitzer base plate and converting that to a composite material. But our applications will also work in armored vehicles. We've done a lot of work in aircraft and drones and things like that. We can make products lighter using less raw material so you get energy efficiency as well. Helmets and body armor. We're also the award winner for the Defense Innovation in 2019 as part of Tech Connect. Next slide. So what other markets can we go into and where are we uh, working with? We have over 35 companies we're working with currently. One is in wind turbine blades, so that leading edge protection. Uh, rain, salt, sand hits these blades, obviously moving at very high speeds. All these little impacts cause damage. The erosion reduces the aerodynamics and it reduces the energy efficiency. So we're working with the global leaders in that. Working with five automobile companies to make uh, skid plates, electric battery housings. Again, a lighter vehicle gets better energy efficiency and can travel further but also their safety improvements as well. And we're working with a half a dozen or more sporting goods companies, hockey sticks, baseball bats, golf clubs, and several others. Next slide. So today, obviously, what, what are we looking for or where can we get some uh, help or assistance? Obviously, just general warm introductions to any manufacturers of composite products, looking to make them lighter, stronger, more impact resistant, or other applications. And then just generally strategic investors. As a startup company, we just launched last year, COVID uh, did not make uh, the best time to launch a company and, and be able to get into labs and do prototyping, but we're making great inroads and we're continuing to raise our uh, seed capital. Next slide. So again, just as an overview, our technology will make all composites, again, carbon fiber, fiberglass, Kevlar, nanotubes, any of the lighter, stronger, more impact resistant, more durably, and more sustainably. And all of this we can do and provide at a lower production cost. Thank you. All right, Chad, great pitch. Um, and I will leave it to the panel to ask questions. Hey, Chad, Gil here. Um, uh, were you able to actually uh, build up a prototype and, you know, and, and, and do the measurements to get the, get the, all those values that you got? Um, and if, if so, what, what, what were you, um, what were you prototyping it for, right? I mean, you could say, you know, were you, were you enhancing Kevlar? Were you enhancing something else? What application was that? Yeah, so all that, all those numbers obviously are backed up by data and lots of different testing. 
it varies from industry to industry. So starting with hockey sticks, they've done four rounds of prototyping and they can't perfect everything, but we've received approximately 30% improvement as the worst application and up to 70%, depending on a slash of a hockey stick or impact with a puck. Same with golf clubs. Uh, we're doing numerous automobile and skid plate testing. Uh, again, well into uh, multiple rounds of prototyping. Uh, working with the global leader in tennis rackets, they're into their fourth round and player testing. And for the first time, hopefully we're gonna see a tennis racket available in the market that doesn't require that plastic bumper at the top because our product makes it so impact resistant. Uh, we are allowed to talk about it, but working with Hexel on the aerospace side uh, and they're doing some uh, prototyping, but I, I, we're not allowed to disclose uh, what's going on there, but it is going well. And how does it change the, the, the manufacturing process for composites? Uh, no change at all. So if it's automatic fiber placement, the robotic arm, you just tell it to go in this helicoid direction. Uh, and again, we will perfect and optimize the angle of rotation and the number of layers, depending on what performance criteria is being uh, sought after. Uh, hand layup, it works as well. We've done pressure vessels with the world leading hydrogen pressure vessel, pressure vessel company in Europe, uh, making this product on a mandrel as well. So all existing manufacturing techniques, all existing composites work. We actually done a lot of testing on flax. So for the first time, flax as a fiber is very weak, but it is a lot more environmentally friendly than fiberglass, but it just doesn't have the protective nature or the strength. Now with a flax based helicoid, we are getting the same results uh, as glass. And with a hybrid of say even 80, 20, 80% 80 of the, a much better bio inspired material like flax, we're achieving better performance than fiberglass. All right, well, hey, I, I have to cut it there, but um mckenzie i'm gonna come to you on the next pitch kick it off first okay all right chad i appreciate it you're off the hot seat all right next up we've got janice ceo of identity strategy partners janice welcome thanks so much i'm happy to be here this is fun um, all right so the floor is yours all right thank you so my name again is janice kephart um i am i run a company called identity strategy partners my company provides um, identity services into the federal government. We worked with DOD and the Army. Um, my partner here is Tassent. They are a biometric provider of hardware and software. They also have work currently with DOD and the Army. We're gonna pivot and talk about uh, physical access control, which is very different kind of subject uh, from the last talk. And our specific CIBR had to do with COVID and um, having a new technology in place uh, to replace the current CAC card system, or at least augment it. So next slide, please. So when it comes to the Army, there is a hybrid of physical access control on buildings. There's no enterprise solution for key buildings on or building campuses. We hope that this CIBR helps the Army change how physical access control is approached and to a more disease-free and more secure campuses that meet both statutory law, as you can see in this slide here, or and as well as the Army installation strategy of 2020. The bottom line is that the statutory law was based on the tragic events of the Navy Yard shooting of 2015. If that imposter had had to use face recognition, he would not have been able to enter the building that day. He uses someone else's common access card, was able to enter the building and cause that tragedy. We are trying to uh, deal with multiple issues at once by switching over to a face only biometric. Um, next slide, please. So solving the problem for the Army, we can go from old school, which is some form of the CAC card um, entry, which every building is slightly different, to a very modern take. This product you see on the right was just released in October. Um, it is hygienic, contactless, it uses face only, it can be integrated with the current CAC card, and it also has an entire back end of enterprise solution that can integrate with the current um, vetting system that is done through visitors and with the CAC cards today. So next slide, please. So our solution is fully derived from the commercial sector. Tassant has 12 years in doing mostly face recognition technologies. Today, they are, for example, Singapore uses TASIN for all of their immigration controls, but sexier, more interesting for us is the fact that the Chicago Cubs um, two years ago started using TASIN for face recognition for their employees access. 
Um, it works with a mask and with glasses. Um, today, Major League Baseball is taking that and wanting to expand it not only to employee access, but to all fans. And in fact, it was tested, a similar product was tested by the Nationals baseball team at the end of this season and went extremely well. So we believe we can bring face recognition forward into the Army um, and, and do so in a way face only. Let me just divert for one second. It's face only because right now, Tassin's algorithms are being tested at 99.5 to 99.8% accurate in this kind of scenario. So next slide, please. So just a, a note on the current ecosystem. We don't want to reinvent anything. We want to be able to insert into what DOD already has going on and what the Army already is using and infuse a biometric centric check into that. We can do that by using the current um, CAC card database that exists using those biometric enrollments and then infusing our back end into it and adding a new segment, which is pedestrian entry. Right now, the Army is working very hard on vehicular entry. They're doing a bake off, but they're not doing as much on the building side. And this is a place where we think we can really, really help. Next slide, please. So just a reiteration of some of the business qualities that we have are listed there in red, better hygiene, convenience, security, better improved image, modern fits into the current Army installation strategy where they want technology that is data informed and smart. This fits in with that. They even talk about smart cities. Um, this fits in with that kind of rubric. Next slide. So our ask is pretty simple and straightforward. We're looking for two to three million to transition uh, the capability to the Army. We don't yet have the full requirements from the Army, so we don't know scale. We don't know if it's 127 CONUS and OCONUS spaces with every single building or something much smaller than that. And that will depend, that will help inform us whether we need a prime partner or not. We just don't know yet. Um, we're waiting on the final award. So we have a proposed timeline there. Uh, I did not have access to Dr. Willis's talk and his roadmap before this. I think we'll probably have to adjust a little bit, but that essentially is what we think we can do. So um, we're looking forward to talking to anybody that wants to talk with us and really appreciate the cohort. FedTech has been wonderful in mentoring us and, and thank you all so much. All right, Janice, go Cubs, appreciate it. All right, well, so yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna mention too, um, the Villanova connection with my, um, with my judge right here. So hopefully that gains me some points. <laughs> I see you're warming them up. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, Mackenzie, we're going to kick off with you with Q and A. Great, thank you, and thank you so much for sharing that product with us, Janice. It's very, very interesting, and go Wildcats. So, um, the the question that I have is is about you mentioned how uh, the Army right now has a bunch of different solutions, right? And I've seen this in my old own company. Um, we don't always update our access all at the same time because it's very expensive and um, cumbersome and um, difficult to do so. So is your solution, um, could, if there were updates and improvements in the product, could your solution offer a software only push to the enterprise versus uh, some of the other solutions that require a full scale um, reinstallation of a new product? Absolutely. And that's one of the beauties of it. We can be as flexible as the Army wants us to be with it. We can provide the hardware and software that's just the physical device you saw. We can provide the back end. We can provide entire service for all of that. So, yes. That's great. And, you know, I, I noticed that you talked about this uh, being um, from the, the security uh, breach, but also um, increasing the hygiene of some of these things that we all touch multiple times a day. Um, obviously, we don't see this pandemic waning the way we would want to. Um, is that one of your key uh, points for, for sales to the Army, um, the, the low touch, um, the, the low key, uh, the more hygiene that you're um, putting forward with this product? Absolutely. And in fact, the first word in the SIBR title is pandemic. 
So this was really put out because of the pandemic, um, I think pushed forward from that point of view. So yes, absolutely. Um, that is one of the selling points. To be fair, we don't know how much uh, using your own CAC card is a hygienic issue, actually. Um, but it is, of course, anything we can do to reduce that disease transmission um, possibility is, is useful. I think the bigger issue is probably security and convenience here for, for the Army going forward. Great. And so is your organization prepared to deal with different levels of access control? Um, you know, some areas may just need a swipe of a card uh, versus some areas where you typically put in a pin or something like that. Uh, does the system um, scale to those different spaces on a Army base? So, um, in regards to the pin, I'm not sure. It has already been built to integrate in with, a, with any kind of access card. So the CAC card, it would have to be customized for that, but it, it's been built for that. The, um, I'm sure that there would be a possibility of in, integrating it with the pin pad. We haven't looked at that yet because this is the goal here is to eliminate the need for having to touch a pin pad. Right. So hopefully we won't need it any, and this would actually replace that. So that's kind of where we're going with it. But I, so I, but I do not know the specific answer to your question. I'm not trying to dance around it. All right. Well, hey, I'm going to jump in. Uh, let's definitely share information to to follow up posts. So, uh, I appreciate you, Janice, and you are off the hot seat. Thank. You. All right. Next up, we have Adam. Adam, welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you guys today. All right. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I'm Adam Locus, uh, PhD out of Michigan Tech. Uh, for those who don't know where Michigan Tech is, it's as far north in, in Michigan as you can go. To give you a feel for what that is, is yesterday I was loading a truck and in, in, uh, in the middle of a snowstorm. So we're beginning to uh, to be that that time of year up here. So anyway, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about our technology platform that we have here, uh, Locus Tech. We have a variety of uh, casting technologies. For the less techy type people, uh, our back our backbone and how we develop products is based on squeeze casting. Squeeze that squeeze casting simplicity. Uh, simply put, is taking metal and pressing it into very tight places. So, a few of these uh, technologies that you see on the screen right right now are you know, lightweight brake rotors, uh, high pressure tanks for natural gas, wear plates. Is really looking at using some unique. Uh, we'll say unique, uh, unconventional uh, casting technologies and bringing those uh, to realize uh, some pretty, pretty cool products. Next slide, please. So just highlighting a few of them is looking at products from a uh, property perspective and what, what's needed uh, downstream. So whether it needs a ceramic fiber for stiffness or strength, ceramic particle for wear resistance, and the durability that a, uh, that a lightweight alloy may bring we start from the raw material, create a ceramic sponge, and then infiltrate that sponge with, with a variety of uh, high temperature alloys and aluminum and magnesium um, that can reach our final properties. Next slide. So similar to what Chad just mentioned previously is one of our products we, we stole from nature, right? Um, looking at the skeletal plate of a sea urchin, you can come up with some pretty unique structures that uh, we can model as a Schwartz P surface, and we use that for the internal structure of a high pressure gas tank. So, a high pressure gas tank is typically round, right? Cylindrical, because that's nature's shape. Um, but nature also has some interesting shapes that can be just as efficient when done this way. So, using some of the unique technologies that are available with 3D printing, we 3D printed a core and then used some uh, low pressure casting techniques with some field assisted uh, techniques to create non-cylindrical high-pressure uh, storage uh, solutions. Next slide. The last one I'll highlight is, is taking, uh, from an armor perspective and some more military-related, is taking some high-tech high products, uh, so say take like a BAE tile that's on the left-hand side and incorporate that in, uh, into a lightweight uh, matrix with tailored material properties at different components to uh, tailor for, for uh, an armor impact. Next slide. 
So how does that relate to what we did in a, in a SBAR? We can take this technology platform and look at it and say, well, if we need a certain impulse load, we can tailor that whole solution to meet, meet this. So it's not a particular um, technology, but a technology database that we have that we can say, hey, should that be squeeze cache? Should that be low pressure cache? Do we need field assisted casting to, uh, to make this product lightweight, durable, but more, more importantly, cost effective and manufacturable? So next slide. So what is our value? We have a, a history of, uh, of a variety of different products. As uh, Tony mentioned, it takes a long time to get some of these products to, um, into market. So a lot of times we're pushing several of those products forward at the same time just to, uh, just to survive and to keep them moving forward. So we have 11 issued patents uh, and a couple more pending. We have a broad expertise in aluminum, magnesium, and uh, metal matrix composite solutions. And we're working with customers to bring from um, what their major challenges are to a final validated products. So what we're looking for from, from you guys today is, you know, what are, what are the challenges? Where can we apply some of these technology solutions to, to work together and, and bring uh, and essentially make uh, exciting new products? So with that, next slide. Um, we've, we've got some pretty unique castings that we have here and some, we've been awarded some, some, uh, accolades for some of the work we've done. So at that point, I'll, at this point, I'll take your, your questions if you have any. All right, Tony, we'll let you kick it off. Yeah, thanks Adam. Uh, a little bit outside my area of expertise. So, so humor me a bit, but, um, on the equipment you need to produce these types of parts, I imagine it's. It's different than what we're looking at today for some of the, the parts we make that we're out of traditional materials. What, what's the sort of changeover? What, what does the equipment look like? So the biggest way, if you look at the most um, highest capital intensive part is a squeeze casting press. So uh, we've built our own custom squeeze casting presses in order to do this. So 1500 ton presses, you know, it, that expand based on the, the projected area of the, the size component you're trying to build. So um, commercially, those are two to $4 million pieces of equipment. Um, like I say, having idea of what, what is required. We've, we've built a lot of these items ourselves. And, and so should I, I should think of this as maybe a tech library. Library by which we're going through a trade, a, a series of trade studies. And we say. This part could be made of this, made of this material versus this 1, here are the specs on it. Here's the. Here's what I need, and that's that's sort of where this comes into play. Is that the way I should think of this? I think that's a good it's a good starting point. I don't want to say that we're that's the only thing we do, right? Is there's a lot of things we'll do in house, but then we partner to say, okay, this this fits. We need to answer a set of these questions to validate that. Hey, you don't need a squeeze casting. You need a low pressure cast product of this alloy type, etc. We can help prove that out in house, and then we work with a series of commercial partners that can help bring those into the into the. Uh, you know, into the army or into a commercial application. Right. No, that's, that's very helpful. And, and there are going to be, I, I wonder with your sieve, did you find size constraints? You get to a point, it's obviously got to fit up press, but you get, you get to a point where, where it becomes difficult to, to produce at that size. Absolutely. So you get beyond a certain point. Like that's the, uh, one of the, one of the things that we have in our background is say, okay, what can you do? You know, what is a conventional size that 80% of the target products are going to fit within this this window but yeah that's uh when it's a pressure game you're limited to a, say a platform size of a three foot by three foot projected area component right right uh my fellow panelists i, I think that's all i have for the questions if anybody else has has ones for this one all right well i'm gonna i'm gonna cut it there but uh adam uh, great job i think you have some questions in chat too so Feel free to jump in there and, and continue interacting with folks. Thank you. All right, next up we have Don from T Works. Don, how are you? Hi, good afternoon. Um, thanks, doing well and appreciate your time this afternoon. Next slide, please. Next one, please. So thanks. I'm president and co-founder of, of T Works and um, we have a technology that we've developed over a number of years, originally under an Army SBIR Phase 1 in 2008. 
to develop initially a power source, uh, central power source on the soldier's weapon, uh, commonly the M4, M16 platform at, at that time. And um, we went through uh, phase two and, and actually some phase two add-ons and are in phase three on that technology development. And um, we went out and got uh, outside investment funding through private equity, not necessarily venture, uh, venture capital or, or um, institutional funding. And um, and that capability we brought forward into what is now the next generation squad weapons program, and also the next gen squad weapons fire control program. And Tony, uh, our company is working with the the, uh, the folks up there in Londonderry on the, uh, the fire control um, program now using uh, some of the capability from this technology. So we we are now working on a new phase one that is seeking to integrate some existing uh, weapon mounted enablers onto the new next generation weapons and even uh, some of the uh, legacy weapons. Um, and that's the FWS thermal site made by Leonardo DRS and the Storm SLX rangefinder made by L3 Harris. Um, and that's a picture there of what one of these smart rail segments look like that are outfitted on the weapon. Next slide, please. So this is the pictures here to, to kind of show you the difference between on the left side, what is the current state of you know a, a soldier's M4 weapon that can and this is even an old picture but you can see all the various devices that can mount on those mounting rails um, on the handguard and on the top of the weapon and great capability that our industry partners here on this panel have provided to our soldiers uh, over the years but the you know the program office and the army hadn't necessarily thought about integration right so you've got thermal sites um, aiming lasers tactical lights, et cetera, that all have different batteries, sometimes different size batteries, different quantities. So this is what ultimately led to the original SBIR where was the Army found that soldiers were carrying in excess of 10 pounds of spare batteries on a 72 hour patrol to power all these different devices and, and their radios as well. So um, T-Work set about um, creating the um, capability here with a central battery pack, in this case, in the buttstock of the weapon. And then we route that that power um, to the mounting rail, and then um, in our later SBIR efforts, we developed a data connection over the same interface. So um, the soldier is able to to mount his devices and configure his weapon the way he wants to, and those devices um, identify themselves and connect to the network on the weapon, and they also draw power from the central power source. Uh, next slide, please. So this, in this slide here, I want to demonstrate that with a uh, power and data connected weapon, a smart a weapon, that becomes an ISR platform that can actively and passively provide data and images from the, the, so the weapon to the, sol initially to the soldier's end user device, if you're familiar with NetWarrior or ATAC, and then, or even to the soldier data enabled radio, and then it can propagate across the battlefield network. So some examples that we, um, demonstrated at, at the Army AWE experiment at Fort Benning a couple of years ago. We're capturing still images through the reticle of the soldier's um, ACOG optic, and also using a laser rangefinder to determine bearing and range to target. So with that uh, information, with a couple of button presses on the weapon, the soldier was able to transmit uh, an image and a location of targets that he was looking at through his, through his uh, optic and didn't have to make a radio call about it, didn't have to engage his net warrior device. It just automatically populated to the screen and dropped onto the map, the battlefield map as a chem light. And that was just one example of what you can do with a weapon once it's uh, powered and connected. Next slide, please. So in terms of, you know, the, there's a dual use component to this capability. We've, as a company, have focused on the US Army and the military in particular mainly because we're a small business and we only have so much bandwidth. So we wanted to, to nail the, the military solution and meet the requirements for the Army and also NATO. We, uh, we, we competed in a NATO competition and won that specification as well for powered rail. So we focus on the military, but there's also a civilian law enforcement and also civilian consumer usage for this capability, which in terms of managing batteries, but also when you have the data capability you can use video, record that, and off offboard it to um, a cell phone and other other applications. Next slide, please. 
So uh, our company, uh, what we're looking for and wanting to brief here is that we're still continuing to look for additional partners and licensees that can make use of this technology and their different programs related to, to small weapon or small arms and other weapon platforms and enablers. But we've also um, engaged with other programs like even on unmanned ground vehicles and UASs that require a power and data interface that is rugged, submersible, can handle you know all the thermal shock and vibe of a weapon platform, but maybe suited for other platforms as well. So if there's um, any interest in those discussions, we'd be happy to have those. And with that, um, I would say too, Gil, um, we've been working with Dr. Bordolami at the Fast Labs um, team there in support of some PEO Stry efforts. Um, and then also McKenzie with Raytheon, we, we uh, have dealt with the Blue Eye team there in uh, Northern Virginia and looking at possibly ingesting some video from the weapon into the into the Blue Eye system. So, um, but would, lo would love to try to expand our, our reach into your companies as well. All right, Don, great job. Gil, we're gonna go to you for, for a question or two. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll throw one out there, um, Don. So looking at this, the, the one picture you had up, the slide that was up that had all of the um, all of the uh, sites and everything on the left and on the right, you're showing showing the rail system. Um, is there an is there a path to um, converting all of those on the left to be compatible with with the rail system, or is is uh, is that something that you know you're looking for those um, the suppliers to to accept and take on. Yeah, good question, um, Gil. So actually, the the current topic, the phase one that we're working on, the Army has funded that to do an adaptation of currently the FWSI and then the Storm Laser Rangefinder, without modifying those devices, but creating a plug-in adapter that will allow those devices to work with smart rail, even though they're originally fielded without that capability built in. And then kind of the, the parallel approaches, we're working with some of the OEMs on the new enablers and new optics that are being fielded that will already have, uh, we make a, a, a postage size network interface card chip that gets um, gets uh, soldered onto the mother, motherboard of, of those optics and allows that to communicate to the smart rail. Um, so it's kind of a dual path adapters for older devices and integration for newer devices. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because because they're you know from their perspective, from their business perspective, there might be uh, incentive if the army is really going to go down this uh, an integrated rail, uh, the smart rail uh, path, then for them to actually make sales, right? They might want to go. Hey, we'll we'll see how we can do this in a cost effective way. So that we're not really creating a high modification, a large modification to the existing product. Um, so, you know, having conversations with them, you know, I, I think is a good idea uh, because it helps you on the defense side to also say, well, by, oh, well, by the way, you know, all these companies are are um, putting a little IRAD into. Um, Compatibility with the rail, right? So, um, so that open opens up the the um, for crazy incentive on the DOD side to say, hey, let's yeah, maybe let's go down that path, um, because then they wouldn't expect to have to pay for all of that. So, if if those companies are going to do it on their own, and it could be it could be a very simple doesn't it necessarily mean to mean the interface changes that there's just they're just connecting somehow. And working out working it out with you. So, okay, I just wanted to bring that up and and make sure that you know there's some some conversation around all that because that could kill a product if all of the accessories cannot are not compatible or they're not willing to change. It could kill your product, right? So you want to push on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. That wasn't really and, a question. Thanks. So. Okay. <laughs> We've spent you know the last ten years meeting with most of the OEMs in the space to try to encourage that, you know, that leaning forward. Now that the Army's made it a requirement with NGSW, we're seeing a lot more activity there to, to get products integrated. All right, Don, 
Well, hey, great pitch. Uh, looks like there's plenty of follow-up conversation after this. So uh, thank you. Thanks. All right. So next up, we've got Quinn from Dinovas. Quinn, how are you? I am doing well. How is everyone doing today? Doing well. The floor is yours. All right, so we'll go ahead and jump into it. I am Quinn McAllister. I'm the president here at Dinovis, and we are presenting on a solution that will address outdated heavy metallic components that are weighing down, slowing down, and reducing the lethality of our warfighters. Our solution for that is the tailored continuous composite, or TAC. So if we go to the next slide, please. So exactly what is TAC? Um, TAC is a solution that can deliver up to 75% weight reduction relative to a steel component. And we're using automated manufacturing techniques to keep the cost of these articles at or below those of casted or welded metals. So the performance is coming from the composite reinforcement, the composite structure. But we're not doing this in the traditional 2D composite technique where we're putting it together as multiple layers. With traditional two-dimensional composites, right, you have your fibers in an orientation in one layer. That's where you get your strength and your load carrying ability. But you're inherently weak in the other orientations. Three-dimensional woven composites have been developed, but that's giving you load carrying in three specific orientations. And it's doing it with a cost of custom um, three-dimensional weaving materials. So TAC is using a fiber steering technology where we're using tailored, tailored fiber placement to put the reinforcement and load carrying ability in the direction the load is actually getting applied. And then we're holding together <clears throat> the layers of this material using a high strength C and T Z stitching process. So we go to the next side, slide please. So that might sound expensive, right? However, each one of these steps can be managed using automated manufacturing techniques. Preforms can be developed using automated tape placement. The Z stitching and fiber steering is done using a standard um, sewing type machine. And then near net shape final parts are being done using resin transfer molding. So cost is kept down by essentially eliminating manual labor and allowing for batch processing. So we go to the next slide, please. So why is TAC applicable to mortar base plates, which are a complex three-dimensional structure? I think the biggest thing here is a base plate weighs over 135 pounds, and that's in addition to all the other equipment a soldier has to carry. Those cast or welded structures are being produced at up to $16,000 a plate. So right now, we as a country are spending up to $800,000 a month on a structure that is slowing down or decreasing the lethality of our warfighter. So we need to be increasing that lethality and we're doing it by reducing the burden and providing them more mobility at the same cost with equal performance at a lighter weight. So you go to the next slide, please. So why is Dynovis the team to answer this call? Well, we're teamed with Hexel and UDRI. We're not doing this alone. We brought in the expertise that's needed. This team delivers expertise in three-dimensional tailored composites, all the way from design analysis and manufacturing, and that includes automated manufacturing, as well as the patented technologies for the ZNTC stitching, the fiber uh, steering capability, and the automated tape placement of dry preforms. Each one of our companies and our personnel have delivered product to the defense industry, so we understand what it takes to do that. And we have the equipment that's necessary and we are already investing internally in the facilities to do this production capability. So that's going to allow us to keep our time and our cost down to transition the technology to the Army for the cost of a phase two cyber program plus qualification run. Because we'll be ready to go at the end of that program, we believe we can deliver an ROI of over two in just six months and that continues to go up. Additionally, because we'll be developing this technology to TRL3 with an MRL3 demonstration within phase one, and then increasing that higher to TRL6 during phase two, we can do parallel commercialization to some of the other opportunities, such as heavy equipment for outrigger plates, 
that can run you up to $125 billion market and get exposure to that immediately. So we go to the next slide, please. So Dynovis has set up our investment and our facility growth in parallel with this SBIR program. We're at the completion of this program, 2025 or earlier, we'll be prepared to do qualification in LRIP. We have a 20,000 square foot manufacturing facility here in Poway, California. We're establishing our AS9100 and ISO 9001 certifications by early next year. And we're again, we're teamed with Hexel and UDRI. So we will be prepared to do the manufacturing in phase one and then investing in the automation that's necessary during the phase two effort so that we're ahead of when this production needs to occur. So we can go to the next slide, please. So that's everything that I had on TAC and on why we're the team to answer the call. I invite anybody to please reach out to me directly with any questions or um, you know, come visit us here in California, especially as the weather starts to change everywhere else. Right. All right, Quinn, I appreciate it. Mackenzie, uh, just gonna go around the horns, kick off with you. Hi, thank you for sharing that with us today. So my question is about, um, have you seen uh, the change in this start to materialize as a requirement for the Army yet? The change in, the, can, you re, can you say that again? I think I missed sure. it. So the, the change in this material uh, to make uh, this plate lighter, have you seen mm -hmm. that? materialize as a requirement yet. Yes, and in many cases, right, the term black aluminum has often been thrown at structures where people want lighter weight, higher performance. Um, the best way to design a composite material is designing it for composites so that you can get the load where you need it. And that's where the fiber steering comes in, and uh, which is a significant benefit over just making the same part out of composites. Great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Great time for one last quick question if you have it. If not, I'm going to let you off the hot seat, Quinn. All right, Quinn. So I right, appreciate um, everyone's time. Yeah, please do check out chat, see if there's additional questions there. Will do. All right. Next up, we have Jeffrey from Kairos Research. Jeffrey, how are you? Oh, we do not hear you, Jeffrey. How about that? Better? That's perfect. The floor is yours. Great. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jeff Kale from Kairos Research. I'm here today to talk to you about our cyber opportunity, which we are chasing, which is identifying and enabling emerging technology leaders in the space of the Army. Uh, thank you for having me here today. If we could just dive right in and go to the next slide. So I represent Kairos Research. I'm an employee here. We're a small startup firm based in Dayton, Ohio. We were founded in 2019 by uh, Dr. Brad Minery. He's a former IARPA program manager. He's the alchemist who kind of makes this world come together. And our calling card is we marry expertise in cognitive science, right? That's the area of psychology that explains how people think with artificial intelligence capabilities. Artificial intelligence has done wonders for our society and will continue to do more in the future. One of the challenges with classic AI systems though is that they can often be seen as brittle and slow to evolve to changing environments. And the reality is that artificial intelligence systems, you know, nearly always operate with heavy personal involvement, right? So making the person and the system work together is very important and we think is the key to having really high performing systems. Our organization has strong ties to academia where we try and make sure we stay on top of the leading edge research in both the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence and cognitive science. And over half of our employees here have PhD degrees. We focus largely on developmental research in the area of 6.1 to 6.3. And our clients to date have been largely in the defense community. And we're really proud of the work we've been able to do largely um, helping out in the intelligence areas, but then some work with DARPA as well too. And um, our company's off to a good start and we're anxious to grow and do more. Uh, next slide, please. So here's our problem statement. 
You know, the Army currently has 36,000 officers who have advanced degrees. That, that's a, a massive amount of people and, and a huge, uh, you know, challenge and opportunity. To put that in context, that's roughly the size of the stadium at the U.S. Military Academy, right? That uh, stadium holds 38,000 people. Now, unfortunately for the Army, these 36,000 officers aren't all in one tidy, convenient place. They're dispersed around the globe. And they're, you know, unfortunately hard to keep track of, right? There's so many people in this cohort that the reality is they can't be managed well on a personal one-to-one -one basis without some pretty significant, uh, you know, digital enablement. So why is this important? The Army is trying to generate a pool of people they call emergency emerging technology leaders. These are the people who are going to interface with technology and really help drive the advancements that the Army finds so critical for the next decade. And if we look at the Army people strategy, you know, they were very clear about saying, you know, statistical analyses, data science techniques are going to be a big part of our future. And the challenge and the opportunity here is that if our top high priority technical talents aren't in the right roles at the right time, in essence, the Army kind of punches below their weight in terms of uh, people power. And that's just unacceptable and something that needs to be addressed, uh, you know, urgently. Um, next slide, please. So what is our uh, solution that we've proposed at uh, Kairos Research? Largely, what we intend to do is leverage a technique called natural language processing or NLP. You might have heard of this. Uh, it's a state of the art data science technique. And when you think about NLP, it really marries computer science, linguistics and artificial intelligence all in one package. It actually is a field that's been around for about 50 years, but the advancements have been very significant in the last 10 years. Uh, largely due to the increase in computing power and the increase in training materials that have been available just with the digitalization of all of our content on the web. So this NLP technique is basically going to take uh, the, the best information we can find about all of the Army people with technical degrees, right? So those 36,000 individuals I mentioned earlier, and if you think about it, on the left-hand side of the equation, we're gonna have that person's CV, right? That's easy enough. Their service records. We're even gonna go out and grab things like LinkedIn records, Google Scholar documentation, Microsoft academic information. We're gonna put everything that they have that's available and curate it in one place. So think about you know, several different types of information coming together. On the right-hand side of the equation, we're gonna have all of these job descriptions for these uh, emerging technology leaders and basically what needs to be filled now. And we're gonna use natural language processing to provide a high-tech matchmaking service to optimize a system that puts the right people in the right roles. And we're gonna do this with a, you know, a speed and a capability that just isn't possible with you know, human management and human intervention. So we're really excited about this for the future, and we think it can be a, a big opportunity for the Army to, again, get these people in the right jobs. One of the challenges you often find of these people with, you know, really advanced degrees is they're not always looking for a job every day of the year, right? They, they aren't real motivated to go out and build their career and always be looking for the next opportunity. So we have to, to not count on them and their, you know, incentives to try and drive them to new opportunities. We need to help manage and nurture that process. So, so something we're watching very carefully. The other thing that we need to point out is having these people in roles that are not necessarily as challenging for them or where they can make as big of a contribution as they might make actually goes right at the heart of tenure for these positions, right? These are high profile, you know, in demand profiles of people. So, you know, trust me, if they can't find the opportunities and the, you know, growth that they want in the Army, there are many, many firms in private industry that would love to have these people. So we need to keep their careers moving and keep them uh, moving at a double time pace. Next slide, please. So we see this as an opportunity for the Army 
but we also see this as a big opportunity for many places, right? Think about the federal market. There's, you know, uh, you know, many, many, many employees. There are 24 million employees, and there are obviously going to be instances where the right people are not in the right jobs. We also think there's a huge private opportunity. Walmart and Amazon each have over a million employees now. Again, that's too many people to manage on a personal one-to-one -one basis. We also think uh, if you looked at firms that are significant global advisory firms, places where talent is everything, um, they're gonna benefit from a service like this too, right? If you look at a place like McKinsey, they operate in 80 different countries. You know, I'm sure that they try hard to keep track of all their people. Is there a room for opportunity, uh, an opportunity for advancement? I'm sure there is. So, so what are we asking? We're looking for additional funding to help us take this and we, we have the technology largely proven, but as with any data science task, there are significant uh, you know, data curation that needs to happen. And we're gonna need help with that, both in terms of funding and then just active participation from the Army side to get that done. We're excited to get started and um, we would love to have you guys join us on the journey. So thanks very much for your time and I'd love to take questions. All right, great pitch, Jeff. Tony, kicking it off with you. Yeah, I have, I have two questions for you. One of the challenges, and, and Mike Bynum can probably attest to this, is that you, you might be learning an old system. You might be training your, your data based on the outdated army system in which they wanna kind of get forward with different MOSs and different structures and billets and whatnot. Um, how do you how do you sort of adjust how does how would you adjust for that not to design on the old system but to design for the the army of the future yeah well i mean it's it's a uh, you know uh, many people will tell you that 80 percent of the energy in a data science project comes in curating the data set right so there's always a lot of that work that has to come into the picture and we always try and develop models that run off different grades of gasoline if that's the analogy right i mean uh, you have to have a car that'll run in mexico and a car that'll run you know uh, in the U.S. where the gasoline is pristine and, and fine. So I think we would have to accommodate that in our design process. And, and unfortunately, we wouldn't have all the information on how to do that until we were kind of knee deep into it. But that's not an unknown task to us. It's something we face on on many projects. And I'm sure, uh, you know, it, it would be one of those things. I'm not sure how much difficulty it would be, a lot or a little, but uh, I'd be confident that we could uh, make that work. Gotcha. <clears throat> and in my second question, I don't, it, this is not a harsh question. I'm actually, it, it will sound that way, but I don't mean it to be. When, when I look at sort of Q 2024 as the TRL5, help, help me understand, it seems like there are tools that can get you most of the way to do this today. So that, that seems like a long time frame. So can you help me kind of think about the special sauce that has to, and, and the documentation that has to come between those two points? Yeah, you know, um, I challenge the assessment that there are tools out there that can get you most of the way there today. I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. And uh, and again, I think a lot of it is going to be data curation. I mean, I, I never underestimate how challenging that task will be, and, and especially the first time you go around, right? I mean, you're going to have to find uh, the records that are in disparate places and and the other thing we always find as a challenge is really tracking down any records that are over a year old is, uh, you know, you turn into a detective, right? So, so that's one of the reasons why the timeline is uh, larger than, than maybe you'd like it to be. I think the other area of the timeline that needs to be built out is obviously we want to have an interface here that allows this system to be run and then rerun. Uh, fairly frequently, right? Because we don't want this to be something you guys do once a year. We want it to be something that gets done once a month, maybe even uh, at a quicker cadence, uh, because we don't want a lot of time to pass uh, before we've looked at these people. So, so again, there's going to need to be a software interface developed, and anytime software development is involved, uh, that unfortunately does add to some timelines. Got it. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks appreciate your questions. It. Okay, Jeff. Well, that is all we have for, for questions, but uh, thank you for the pitch. And uh, I think there's plenty of continued conversation to keep going. Thank you. All right. So last up, Joe, you are the final pitch. <laughs> Hello. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. The only thing uh, 
between us and closing on time is me. So we'll get right after it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm Joe Condon, uh, president and founder of Oxidine. Uh, we are uh, the only company in the world that designs, develops, and manufactures auxetic foam padding. And I'll get to what auxetic means in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> we have commercial presence in our revenue generating in our three chosen verticals, military, sports, and medical is where we think auxetic foam can outperform uh, can what I would call conventional foam. And uh, we do ship globally. We uh, just completed our first pallet load shipment to the Ministry of Defense in the UK. So we, we do provide and source um, our foam, sell our foam globally. Next slide, please. So our SBIR topic is for improved impact protection in the safest, uh, what is currently the safest uh, US Army aviator helmet, uh, the HGU 56P. And the, the initiative here is to not touch the helmet shell, but only change the padding, which Velcro's in and out is changeable. Uh, and the goal is to achieve 40% uh, improved impact energy on the current system. So the, the goal here is obviously superior soldier protection relative to head injuries. Next slide. So Oxidine, um, what is this notion of auxetics? Again, protection to the user is what we're after, reducing brain injuries, reducing impacts uh, that occur. So this auxetics by definition, if your material have a material science background is a negative Poisson's ratio. And so what happens to auxetic materials in a state of compression, which is what foam padding sees, is the structure collapses onto itself and produces a local density gradient, which outperforms its unloaded state. So the harder you push on auxetic foam, the higher the performance gets. Different than conventional foams, which think about compressing a, a, uh, a marshmallow on the table, the structure moves away from the load, and in auxetic structures, the structure moves to the load to better support it. So that's uh, that's why we think this technology uh, makes a difference and matters. And some of our customers would say the same. Other ideal applications for foam padding uh, with the U.S. Army and other branches of the DoD would be other helmet liner systems. Obviously, body armor, vehicle seating, uh, high value packaging. You know, we transport mission. Uh, missiles and ballistics, and they need to be protected and taken care of. And, and this auxetic foam would be ideal and certainly machine vibration dampening. So why Oxidine? Uh, we're the only commercially available auxetic foam in the world. We're 100% Barry Amendment compliant. We are a certified WOSB. And interestingly enough, our technology research was originally funded uh, through a grant from the US Veterans Administration to Florida State University. We're licensee of said technology and have added our own complementary patent to that. Next slide, please. So, so why does auxetics matter? Does auxetics matter in foam padding? And the answer is yes. This is an ASTM test, which measures load and displacement. The harder I push the foam, how much does it collapse? Um, and so this is the exact same piece of foam. We do not make foam. We purchase certain commercially available foams and we convert it into an auxetic structure by manipulating the web. And you can see this exact same piece of foam is equal in that low load comfort, right? It's a low load when the helmet's on, you have some compression and it feels pretty good. Um, the auxetic phenomenon kicks in under high load. And you can see in this case, we took a piece of conventional foam we uh, converted it to an auxetic structure. We got an 82% increase in its high load support um, and an 87% increase in this notion of compression modulus, which the Polyurethane Foam Association says is the most important thing to measure in any foam usage. So yeah, we can, we can take conventional foam and make it 60, 70, 80% better um, than where we started. Next slide, please. So we had a wonderful project with the US Army and the ACH, the Advanced Combat Helmet, and we were asked to test our foam um, against today's current standard across, we, we can manufacture 60, 70, 80 variations of auxetic foams uh, today and more coming. Uh, everything we made, you can see past the current standard, 150 G max, 
um, at a certain impact level. And so 150 G's and above is where concussions are high probability. So you can see everything down in the 100, 120 range, no matter what we made, uh, we can meet today's current standard. Next slide, please. This particular project was to tease out, can we hit a the same 150 G max standard with twice the impact? So we had a 100% increase in the impact. And the answer is, yes, we can. And if you go back, don't go back, but the previous slide showed us hovering around the 100, 110 range. And you can see that at twice the load, we still hover around that 100, 110 range, which demonstrates the effect of the auxetic foam. It actually changes structure as it's impacted. These hits in the in the in the uh, army uh, test lab were so severe they permanently damaged and ruined these are ballistic shells and you can see how hard the drop was on a cylindrical anvil. Um, they destroyed these helmets and our foam performed um, equally uh, to half of the load as it did at twice the load. This project concluded with the U.S. Army in January 2019 with these results. And we have since um, kind of hit the wall with contracting, but we keep pushing the envelope to try to find our way. Uh, so we're interested, we're super excited about this cyber opportunity. Next slide, please. So we also have technology um, licensed from Florida State University as a bolt-on. Uh, we can treat our auxetic foam, and this only works on auxetic foams. Um, and you can see that uh, we can actually measure impacts. We can measure location and magnitude. And so um, with further development, the foam, is, the foam is commercially viable. We sell foam to the Army today. We sell it to other sports and medical companies today. This technology would need a little bit of development, but it opens the opportunity for fact-based real-time concussion monitoring with data. And so, uh, pretty excited about about exploring that opportunity uh, at a future place, at a future time. Next slide, please. Here's our contact information. Next slide, please. Again, what we're seeking here in the ask is uh, opportunities to make a safer and more cost-effective uh, U.S. Army, and that's really what we're looking for: is opportunities to apply this. You know, it's a material science platform. We don't really have a product. We have a material science platform we can make many, 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 many products out of. So well, thank you for your time. Okay, Joe, uh, appreciate that pitch. And Gil, we're gonna close out with questions from you. All right, sounds good. Um, so uh, one first, first question is, do you also get an acoustic improvement in the foam by doing this? Okay, so, yes, so you sir. can also go into like, Sound studios and, and and such and anechoic chambers and such and and, and create improvements. Um, okay. Yes, sir. Um, Auxetic, yeah. auxetic foams, have, let me jump in there, Gil, if you will. Auxetic foams have been um, studied and white papered in university settings for 25 years. Um, nobody could ever solve how to mass produce until FSU solved that problem. And then our, our oxidine patent came in behind it. What well, we have, our IP is method of manufacture, but there are 20, 30, 40 white papers on auxetic foam created in laboratory settings that show um, impact attenuation improvement, sound dampening uh, uh, approved improvement, thermal insulation improvement. It just is taking foam in its what we call conventional state and just improving its performance pretty much across, um, across the uses of foam. Okay. Um, Another question I have around the the cost, right? So you're taking foam and modifying the foam, right? For with with this structure, then, um, what kind of added cost are you putting into that foam? So if I, if 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 I'm if I'm buying a bunch of foam for my products, right, and I want to say upgrade it to this foam, is there you're right? What kind of added cost might I be? I'm, I, I'm not looking for dollars from you, right? But you know. <laughs> Is, is, is are you able to actually embed this into the foam manufacturing process where you can it, it, it could maybe be a no cost change or it could be a very minimal cost change so it cannot be embedded into the current the, the, the way foam is manufactured is it's a liquid cocktail that's poured out onto a bed and it percolates up and freezes at ambient temperature and that's how the structure is formed 
Um, so that cannot be done, at least at this point, we don't see our way there. So there is obviously some added costs. Uh, we generally, the high this high performance solution generally would not compete with standard conventional, what I would call commodity foam, which is what we use as our base material. It would compete with other high performance impact attenuation materials. Most of those in sports, military helmets, you know, we won a couple of NFL helmet awards. Somebody mentioned the NFL and football in here. We've won a couple of awards to pursue this. Most of those other technologies um, are what's called closed cell. So they're more rubbery than they are foam. Ours is the only open cell, which open cell, closed cell generally means our technology for equivalent performance can be lighter weight and open cell breathable, therefore a lot more comfortable for human interface. Okay. And if I can ask one more short sure. question, this may right. be Last the one yes or no question. We got you. <laughs> <laughs> um, does the, the, does the foam and the modified foam then have a spring constant that would degrade over time with, you know, if you were to say compress it, you know, 10,000 times, is, is, is that how, how it would still work? So um, we did some development and exploratory work with a, a certain company who's the world leader in athletic footwear. And uh, early on, just prior to athlete evaluation, the insole in a running shoe, which is the part that you contact that seven or eight millimeter thick, that's the piece that wears out. We performed at 200% of their allowable tolerance and they quit testing on an endurance test. It's 500 miles of a simulated run on a mechanical foot on a concrete surface. Uh, at 1,000 miles, <laughs> we were so far under their allowable permanent deformation, they quit testing. And uh, we believe that's one of the reasons that we did ended up not going to market with them. Our foam lasted too long. It was designed obsolescence in running shoes, then they didn't, <laughs> they didn't want to extend that from three months to three years. And that's what the data kind of suggested. Okay. I was going to say, I want to buy that shoe. So, <laughs> all right. All right. Well, hey, uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and close out there. Joe, I appreciate you pitching today. And uh, please do follow up with uh, our panel here uh, post this discussion. Uh, to the panel, Mackenzie, Gil, Tony, I appreciate your time. Um, I know you could have been other places, but you were here with us today. So, thanks a lot. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care.